If Theology Nara has blessed you or challenged you or encouraged you on some level, then I would like to invite you to consider supporting the show by visiting patreon.com forward slash theology in the raw. You can support the show for as little as five bucks a month and get access to various kinds of premium content like monthly Q&A podcasts, the ability to ask me questions and dialogue with other Patreon supporters. Uh, Gold level supporters are able to participate in monthly Zoom chats where we talk about uh, pretty much everything. Those chats can get pretty wild sometimes, and I absolutely love it. So join the uh, Theology and Raw community by signing up at patreon.com forward slash Theology and Raw. Okay. uh, Hey, folks. Welcome back to another episode of Theology and Raw. This podcast conversation is a very sensitive one for obvious reasons. Oh, where do I start? I, you know, like many of you, probably all of you, my mind and heart have been um, filled uh, recently, especially over the recent um, war that is going on in the land of Israel and or Israel Palestine. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about um, language here in this podcast episode. And I've been listening to a lot of news reports, outlets, watching videos, looking at stuff, realizing some stuff is accurate, other stuff is misinformation. A lot of things have a narrative surrounding them. Um, and I, I just, I want to get a full understanding of the ongoing conflicts and tensions and wars that are happening between Palestinians or specifically, um, certain groups like Hamas and the, uh, Israeli government. Um, I, in my, um, pursuit of knowing what's going on. I came across uh, a really fascinating podcast conversation on Tim Whitaker's uh, New Evangelicals podcast. I know some of you listened to the New Evangelicals podcast. Um, And Tim did a fantastic three-part series um, that I would encourage everybody to go go listen to. The third one of that three-part series was with our guest today, Daniel Benora. And uh, I was very impressed and blown away at both Daniel's knowledge and also his, well, his knowledge, his experience, his nuance, and his tone. I I just really appreciated um, hearing his perspective on the whole thing, especially as a Palestinian Christian who grew up in the West Bank, just outside of Bethlehem, literally born, well, born in Jerusalem, grew up in the shepherd's field outside of Bethlehem. And, and in, he talks about his, his upbringing um, at the beginning of this, of this episode, very well educated as a bachelor's degree from university of Florida, a master's degree from London school of theology, another master's degree in Islamic studies from university of Chicago and is pursuing a PhD in theology from Notre Dame university. I think the perception of this podcast could be perceived as what some people call both sides or you know, uh, it's, it's certainly not this, it's certainly not justifying or excusing or diminishing the evil that Hamas committed on innocent civilians. Um, and, and, and we, we both make that clear. Daniel makes that clear. We don't, we don't really get to the current situation until I would say the last half of this very long podcast conversation. Okay. So, um, we, we don't jump immediately into the current uh, war. Uh, be- well, that's the whole point of this podcast is because there's this, this, this thing didn't start like a week ago. Like there is a hundred plus year history here that's important to understand. And so I brought Daniel on to help us um, understand the, the lengthy history, um, uh, history of, the Jewish people and the Palestinian people living in the same land together, which, which has led to the current state of Israel and the West bank and the Gaza strip and so on and so forth. Um, so let me just say, let I just say this <laughs> super clear up front. We say it again and we'll say it several times in the podcast. Um, by trying to give historical and social and religious context to the events in no way diminishes the, the atrocities that Hamas committed against um, innocent people. 
Um, and I would, I'm going to turn right around and say, I also, and we condemn that. And I say, we also condemn the retaliate, retaliate, retaliation um, that has led to the death of thousands of innocent Palestinians, including, I believe, around or over a thousand children. So by giving a fuller context, we are certainly not excusing or justifying evil at all. We are not doing what some people call both sidesism, both sidesism, uh, like, okay, you have this side, but hey, but what about this side? And you just kind of run around in circles and don't actually address the evil that is happening. Um, I think it's important to give context to complex situations. So that's what we're going to do in this podcast. Without further ado, um, let's jump into our conversation. Please welcome to the show for the first time, Daniel Benora. Daniel, thanks so much for um, taking the time to come on Theology and Raw. I know this is kind of last minute. Reached out to you um, just a couple well, yesterday, I think, so uh, or a couple of days ago. So th- yeah, thanks so much for taking the time to have this. I mean, really important conversation. Yeah, thanks, Preston. It's good to be with you. I appreciate the interest in uh, listening to me and to listen to the especially the Palestinian voice and the Palestinian Christian voice uh, in the middle of what's happening right now in Palestine and Israel. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I mentioned, I think I mentioned the intro. I haven't recorded the intro yet, but people listening to this have already heard it. So that's weird. But um, I just was so impressed and, and, and with your conversation with Tim Whitaker over at the New Evangelicals podcast. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my word, I, um, yeah, I was like, I, I reached out to Tim right away and says, dude, can you... I just want to do that again on my podcast because <laughs> it was so, I, I, and awesome. as I told you offline, I told Tim, I said it was extremely informative. Um, but I also love the tone in which you, you went about mm. it. Cause I know we are, everything is so volatile and rightly so and insensitive. And I thought you, um, gave a perspective that maybe some people, a lot of people in the West at least aren't, uh, attuned to, um, but you did it with a lot of grace, Christian grace, you know? Mm. So, um, thank you. Yeah. I, I, thanks. I mean, that means a lot and I'm, and I'm grateful and I'm, and I'm just, um, yeah, I feel a lot of gratitude towards what you're saying here. And honestly, like, I don't think I was saying anything radical or new or like we've been saying this for a long time and, and I'm just like being kind and being charitable and like try and it's just basically the you know, reasonable, natural outworking of loving someone or like loving your neighbor, like try to understand what's happening, why it's happening, try to show empathy and care. Um, But I mean, but also your response also highlights a huge problem in the American Christian slash evangelical discourse where we are Mm -hmm. too quick to vilify and ignore and, Mm -hmm. and attack anyone who disagrees with us. And um, so there's a lot of work and there's a lot Mm -hmm. of work that Christians have to do in, in, Reflecting on our on our own biases and attitudes, and and figure out a a better way to engage with people who, especially those who disagree with us. Hope, I mean, I, I understand this has been very difficult in the last like six eight years, um, but I think there's I think it's 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 essential to our witness as Christians that we mm-hmm. we learn how to do this well, um, yeah. and I think the world the church fundamentally needs to do this well, and I think the world needs Christians to also be engaging in this work. So yeah. T- tell us real quick for people who don't know who you are. Who 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 are you? What do you what do you do for uh well for work <laughs> or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no thanks. Uh, so I am uh, I am Palestinian. I'm a Palestinian Christian uh, from the little town of Bethlehem. Uh, Were so you born you... in Bethlehem? Were you literally born? Uh, in Bethlehem? I wasn't. I was actually born in Jerusalem, okay. uh, just to like flex some more. So <laughs> I was born in Jerusalem and I grew up in Bethlehem. My family is from the a little town um, by Bethlehem called Beit Sahur. It is the biblical shepherd's field. Hmm. Um, so we joke and say, well, you know, I'm a descendant of one of the shepherds, you know, oh, who, wow. who were there when Christ was born. Um, so I come from this kind of long legacy of Christian um, the Christian presence in the Holy Land, in in what we Palestinians call Palestine, and we can talk about naming and terminology and why that is important, especially vis-a-vis the term Israel. Uh, but Palestinian Christians and Palestinians in uh, Christians, I mean, in the whole region, have been there in the Middle East, in in the Holy Land for two thousand years, and and we mm. we say. We can't really prove it, but we say that we are the descendants of the Church of Jerusalem, the Church of Pentecost, and that we maintained 
our presence in the land, our presence in that region, in that region, proclaiming Christ and living out the kingdom and for the last 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, and we jokingly also to flex, we say that it is us who um, sent out missionaries, you know, from the land to the West and evangelized the pagan, your pagan ancestors. So you're welcome. So that's, <laughs> these are my people. Um, but I say this jokingly and hopefully people can laugh at this. I, but that's, I mean, I, I am, we, if, if you're of European descent or non um, right. um, Palestinian descent, then you are a product of right. the Great Commission of right. people exactly. like yeah, yeah, your yeah, yeah, ancestors yeah. doing what Jesus said to do. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm being obviously. I'm like, yeah. I'm joking. I, I can't really prove any of this, but, but I'm, I'm making this point to highlight this ignorance about, and, and I think this is gonna, I think this informs a lot of how the West and how Americans think about the Middle East and how they think about Arabs and about Muslims, and the assumption, and maybe some of your audience is gonna like, you know, admit this. That the assumption is the Middle East is just full of Arabs and Muslims, and mm. and have this very like simple narrow like essentialist attitude. Oh, these are the bad guys, you know, you know, I don't know, the brown people or, you know, the Muslims and Arabs who are violent, who are, you know, such and such. And, and that stereotype is fundamentally is, you know, hate to say it, but it's very racist. You know, the, the assumption that the, the, the essentialist reductionist attitude towards the other um, is, I think, at play and has been at play, at play for a long time in how the West mm. viewed the Middle East and the East in general. But the Middle East, if anyone from your audience uh, has been to Palestine, has been to the Middle East, would know it's a very rich um, society, very multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multilingual multi society. Um, so it's not just Arabs. Like I'm, I'm an Arab in so far as I speak Arabic, but that doesn't mean that my identity, my culture, my ethnicity mm. is actually Arabic. Um, <clears throat> We only speak Arabic because of a long legacy of Muslim presence in the land and so on. But even Palestine itself to can emphasize the diversity and the beauty of, of Palestine. Uh, it's a very rich um, mm -hmm. society and community. Um, when it comes to religion, before 1948, we can talk about Muslims uh, who were the majority at the time, but also a very sizable, significant uh, Christian minority around 11% of the population in 1917 was Christian. And we also have Jewish, Jewish Palestinians, what we call Jewish Palestinians, uh, who spoke Arabic and lived alongside Muslims mm -hmm. and Christians. And we have a lot of also significant um, religious minorities, like the Samaritans. Um, yeah. There are like a, a thousand Samaritans or so on in, in Nablus, in the West Bank. Uh, and you have the Druze as well, and you have the Ahmadis, and you have the Baha'is in Haifa and so on. Um, and then when it comes to the Christians, you know, the vast majority of Christians in Palestine, including my family, is Greek Orthodox. Mm. I'm not or Orthodox right now. I actually, I'm a pastor's kid. My dad is a Baptist pastor. Mm. And I am kind of moved away from, from that uh, identification. And I, and I see myself more um, kind of following more like Mennonite uh, thinking of pacifism and kind of, kind of this radical uh, understanding of the kingdom of God and so on. Mm. Uh, but I grew up as a pastor's kid, as a Baptist, as a <clears throat> kid of a pastor, uh, Baptist pastor. Um, but the larger Palestinian uh, society is Orthodox, um, mm. Roman Catholic, Latin Catholic. Um, and then you have Syrian, Syriac Christians, you have Armenian Christians, you have Coptic Christians, and you have so many different, different mm. diverse communities of faith in Palestine. Um, so anyway, it's a very rich society. Mm -hmm. um, can and I ask real, essentialist... real, real quick, yeah, is ahead, that, um, you said, I think you said 1917, about 11%. Mm -hmm. What is that now? Yeah. And is there a difference between Palestinian Christians in Gaza versus the West Bank? Like, is there a more of a Christian presence in the West Bank versus Gaza or, or is it about the same? Yeah. I mean, I guess that it takes us to the whole question about the history of what's happening and okay. what's been happening there since 1917. Um, so uh, before I answer that specific okay. question about um, Christian presence and so on, Palestinians uh, like myself and all of us really do not understand what, what happened last Saturday or 10 days ago in, on October 7th to be like something that is new or different. And we see this kind of new escalation of violence as a continuation of a long legacy of mm. violence and oppression um, that did not begin in Saturday, on Saturday, did not begin 
in 67 when the Gaza Strip was occupied did not begin in 48. We actually say it's a 105 year long occupation okay. or struggle uh, against the empire, against colonization of the Palestinian indigenous populations that began in 1917 with the Balfour Declaration. Okay. When the British prime minister at the time, Balfour, sent a letter to European Jews promising them a Jewish homeland in Palestine without explicitly, he said that, without uh, consulting the wishes of the local inhabitants of the land, i.e. the Palestinians like myself. So this is a, a long, and we can, can unpack yeah. the British Empire, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the British Mandate in Palestine, and then eventually the rise of Israel in 1948. Um, yeah, can you give us a brief, but, so like prior to Bal the, the Balfour Declaration, let's just go, just like a brief overview, like, who is right. living in the land that we call Israel? Um, right. What was that like, like in the late 1800s, early 1900s? Like, like what was yeah. going on in, in, in Israel? Right. So just to answer the previous question, okay. <laughs> um, Christians in the Gaza Strip are Palestinian Christians. And mm -hmm. there's like a thousand, less than a thousand of them right now uh, remaining. Okay. Um, and, the, and we have Palestinian Christians in the West Bank, like myself from Bethlehem, mostly Christian in Palestine, Palestinian Christians resided in like the big kind of Christian cities. So that includes Bethlehem, includes Jerusalem, includes Nazareth, which is a completely Palestinian city in Israel. And a, a large, I forgot the percentage now, but a large number of its population is Christian Palestinian okay. who are citizens of Israel. So all of us are Palestinian Christians. All of us, we live in different political realities. So myself yeah. lives under, I as a Palestinian, in, from Bethlehem, I live under the military occupation in the West Bank. Christians in Gaza live under a, a grueling 16-year-old blockade of the Gaza Strip. Um, Palestinians and Palestinian Christians in Israel today, who Israel likes to call Arab Christians or Arab or Arab Israelis, um, which is a very like problematic term because you remove your nationality or ethnicity mm. from them and you define them by their language. It's like mm -hmm. calling you English because you speak English, which is like silly. Um, but that's kind of part of like an Israeli legacy of of erasing Palestine, you know, erase, taking over the land. And I'll get to this in a bit and calling it Israel. So if you have Palestinians in what is what is today Israel, you cannot assert their own national identity. So you call them Arab because that's the, the next best thing you can say. Well, let's define them by their language vis-a-vis vis vis us, the Jewish, you know. Jewish Israelis. Um, so all of us are kind of united in our kind of own history. Like I said, most of the Christians are Orthodox, um, but you have Catholics and you have Protestants, Evangelicals, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, that's that's yeah, kind of the that's general kind of. Yeah. But right now, which is important, and I think that takes us to your uh, question about the history, the, Palest the Christians of the land, we're now down to basically three to four percent. Okay. In the West Bank, we are basically 1% right now. In in the Gaza Strip, out of 2.2 million Palestinians, only less than 1,000 of them are Christians. Okay. And in, in, in East Jerusalem, we have a good population. And then in what is called Israel proper, as it's, as it's defined internationally, you have a, a significant population in Nazareth and in Haifa. But then altogether, we're talking about like a small population of the whole, like, Muslim and Jewish uh, okay. populations of Palestine and Israel. Um, yeah. Just a note on, on on terminology. I think it's important before I talk yeah. about the history. Um, all Palestinians consider the whole land to be Palestine. Okay, and and that that's going to be explained when I talk about 1948 and then in context and and then in relation to Hamas and okay. all Israelis and most Israelis at least would consider the whole land is to be Israel. Um, okay. And then Palestinians basically lost this this battle of terms uh, because we lost the land. So Palestine doesn't exist anyway anymore, and we're relegated to these kind of different communities. You have a community of Palestinians in the West Bank, you have the Gaza Strip, you have East mm -hmm. Jerusalem, but now the rest is now called technically called Israel. Right. But for Palestinians, and like I said, I'll deal with this, all of the land has been Palestine, continues to be Palestine. Okay. Um, for the general, like naive American, the place is called Israel, right? This right. is just the typical discourse. But if you have a little bit of a understanding, you would say, well, you know, there's a Israel and there are the occupied territories, the Palestinian territories, and these mostly refer to the West Bank and to the Gaza Strip. 
and the West Bank includes East Jerusalem. So these are the occupied territories and that are waiting to be resolved in this kind of peace process uh, of what we call the two-state solution, where the land would be divided among the Israelis and the Palestinians. Okay. Um, I So I think terminology is important. Uh, I sometimes, if you catch me on a bad day, I just call it Palestine because that's an ideal, um, an understanding of, of Palestine that is inclusive, that, like I said, Palestine historically included Jews. So it's an idea of, of a land that is inclusive to all of its inhabitants. Mm-hmm. Um, Israelis, on the other, on the other hand, kind of have this. We'll deal with this. Ju- this Jewish supremacist ideology that sees Ju- Israel to be the homeland of the Jewish people, and per Israeli law, only Jews have sel- have self determination in the land. So it's only exclusive, and the power is going going to one ethnic slash religious group. But Palestine is more inclusive idea. But the proper way to think about it is to just call it. Palestine Israel or Israel Palestine, okay. Palestine dash Israel, which is in a way that you try to humanize and acknowledge the existence of two people that mm-hmm. call this place home. Um, so I mean, anyway, it's, 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 it, no, that that's really helpful, and I, I I really appreciate the thoroughness. I mean, it's it's it, it's it. I'm I I think I would say it's 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 part of this broad colonial colonialism project, right? So I mean the. Mm. Uh, I would imagine that people in many parts of Africa would would feel the same that the modern political borders um were kind of imposed on you know indigenous ethnic people um it is yeah anyway I mean and I don't know enough about that you know I I know enough to know that there's you know similarities there and and I do think language yeah la- language is really powerful yeah, as, huge, as huge. you and I both yeah. know so um how, how do you yeah, want so, me to if I if I refer to the land as Israel Palestine is that a neutral? Um, yeah, that, that's great. Yeah, okay. Palestine okay. and Israel, Palestine. Okay, you know, Palestine Israel, you know, hyphenated would would work. Okay. Um, yeah, but to your point, yeah, um, you name it, you claim it. Like lo- language is super powerful, yeah. and I think the discourse that says this is Israel, essentially, you know, perhaps not not intentionally, but. D- erases Palestinians, erases mm. a long struggle for Palestinian freedom, erases a people that have always been in the land, and we become invisible. And this is evident in political discourse. This is, a, this is very clear in very theological formulations where they talk about Israel, the land of Israel, and also in tourism and pilgrimage where you go to Israel to see the holy sites. But you just ignore that the churches exist there because of the Palestinian Christians who maintain these churches and they pray in these churches. So language is very important. And like unintentionally, this language of only Israel mm. is dehumanizing. We become invisible. We, we, we're not human. We're not part of the imagination and the thinking and even the piety of mm. Western Christians. We're not, we're invisible. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's part of going back to your question. That's part of like the whole legacy and the history of, of, um, of all of that. You want to deal with that now? Yeah, let's go back there. Yeah, back. yeah. So I, I, All right. So, as, as I think pre nineteen forty eight, my my just think I I don't have a picture in my mind of what maybe a bunch of Bedouins or something there. Like I just don't know what was going on in the yeah. land of Israel prior to the Balfour Declaration. Yeah. So yeah, not Bedouins. <laughs> like I said, <laughs> it's a very rich society, and and it's just it's yeah. I don't think you meant this, but yeah, there is this Zionist narrative and and myth um that this is a land without people for a people right. without a land like this was a very common zionist uh, mm-hmm. uh, propaganda yeah. uh, statement and, and let me admit i've been um i still have a lot of that in me uh, right. it, yeah. ignorance that i'm trying to read out even in this yeah. conversation so and, yeah, and that's so. precisely what what i said like this kind of this legacy of, of erasing palestinians and it's and it's like it's insane to me to assume that the most important you know property in the whole world, like the Holy Land, Palestine, Israel, is assumed to be empty or to be without culture or civilization. Mm. Like it's just insane and just like betrays a super problematic, right. dare I say, like also like racist attitudes yeah. towards the Middle East. And I can, I think I alluded to that earlier, um, but to assume like cities like Jerusalem or Bethlehem or Nazareth or like, like Akko, who's like, which is like a crusader city from like the 12th and 13th century. And and, and Jaffa and so on and Gaza to be like desolate is insane. <laughs> it's insane <laughs> and it's ridiculous and it just like goes against everything that we know about history. <laughs> but that's just unfortunately like Americans especially who do not really have a good grasp of history or geography. And like, mm-hmm. So I mean, I, I get it, but it's just, yeah. man, come on, do better. <laughs> but anyway, um, 
yeah, the history of, of the conflict, again, I said this earlier, did not start last Saturday, did not star, start 16 years ago when the blockade of Gaza was enforced, or in 67 or in 48. It began, I would say, even and since this is a Christian podcast, it began in the middle of the 19th century with um, people like Darby and Schofield and mm. dispensationalism, that which is kind of basically the 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 launch the the launch of proto Christian Zionism that conceived these dispensations and that required Jews to be in the land for Christ to come back and they pushed heavily driven by a very terrible way to read the text but it's also by a, a bit of anti Semitism as well how do you take care of this Jewish problem. Um, what what they call the Jewish problem is like, well, let's get rid of the Jews. You know, let's send them to Palestine. Um, so this was the rise of, of Christian Zionism. I'm not the expert on it, but there are some fantastic works by Robert Smith and, and others. Hmm. I can, we can put this in the show notes and that highlights the kind of the religious history of, of Christian Zionism that eventually led by the late 19th century to the rise of Jewish uh, uh, Zionism. And uh, with people like Herzl um, from in Europe and others, which also driven by a pursuit for establishing some kind of national identity uh, up and against, and uh, you know, in in agreement with other nationalist movements in France and in the U.S. and so on, that wanted to like assert like a an a, 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 a unified Jewish identity that is grounded in a place in a land, mm. and most of these. Jewish Zionists were not really particularly religious, but they understood that Palestine, uh, which was called Palestine at the time, is a legitimate place for them to pursue, mm -hmm. to have their, their homeland established there. And they love, and also, by the way, the conditions of many of, of European Jews at the time, despite anti-Semitism, which is in the genes, if you will, of a lot of European Jews, uh, Euro European Christians at the time, a lot of these Jews um, enjoyed a lot of power and privilege, like the Rothschilds, and others in the British Empire that were very influential, and and so Jewish Jewish Zionists pushed heavily and lobbied, uh, especially within the British Empire, by the by the rise, the beginning of the twentieth century, um, to basically pursue a homeland for themselves in Palestine, um, and and that's why. So the Balfour Declaration that I referred to in nineteen seventeen was was sent by Balfour, the Prime Minister of the time. To Rothschild himself, the you know the patriarch of the Rothschild family, telling him, after a lot of lobbying by the Rothschilds and others, we look favorably upon establishing a Jewish homeland in Palestine. And now, at the time, the Ottoman Empire had collapsed. Um, World War II, World War One was over. The empire, the colonial powers at the time, the British and the French and the Russians, basically divided the, spo the, the, the spoils of the war. And the British had what we call the British Mandate over Palestine. So, the, and this is a result of what is called the Sykes-Picot Agreement of the French and the British, where they looked at the map of the Levant, the Middle East, and they basically drew these ridiculous lines uh, to define Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Palestine, and then and also Egypt. And then, but at the time, the British had the control over Palestine. There's a long story there to unpack. I encourage anyone to like pick up a book on the history of the Middle East, and they can work through this. But the Balfour Declaration was was issued, and that facilitated and encouraged a lot of Jews from Europe to uh, to come to Palestine. Some driven by just frustration with anti-Semitism, and some driven by some kind of messianic um, ideologies that thought that their presence in the land was important. Most religious Jews at the time rejected Zionism because it it, it was perceived as antithetical to the rabbinic uh, traditions that understood that the, the kingdom of Israel could only be established by the Messiah mm. and not by a secular national state. And they saw this, and this actually a lot of uh, religious Jews today continue to maintain this position that Israel is um, a sort of an idolatry that replaces the Messiah with a secular state. So it doesn't represent them. And some of them like live in Jerusalem and so on just because of their history there and otherwise, but they consider the secular state of Israel to be antithetical to how they understand their Judaism. So you have, you have a lot of these Jews who kind of show up at many protests for Palestine saying, 
uh, Judaism is not Zionism and not in our name. And these are actually not, not even some of them go to an extreme measure to call Zionists to be non-Jews because they're not really following the precepts and the teachings of the rabbis of all. Um, but anyway, so that so Jewish migration into the land began. Some of them bought, bought property in Palestine, especially again, across the coastal line of Palestine. Um, around, I think, by 48, around 5% of the land was bought by Jews. Um, well, that's and Palestinians only, only, five, only 5%. Oh, okay. Only so 5%. Still, of the Palestinians yeah. overwhelmingly still owned the both yeah, the land? Well, or, yeah. Yeah, well, we need to also talk about like w what private property looked like, and especially uh, the impact of col colonialism on Palestine. We have been colonized, and that's a thing of the Palestinians. And this has like been a very like talking point by all of Zion. When did you ever have a Palestine? It was never a free Palestine. It's like, yeah, you're right, because we've been colonized. <laughs> right. Just like the Indians and African nations, we have not is have have been able to establish our homeland because of the history of the Ottoman Empire that took over the whole Middle East, and then the British Mandate that took over chunks of of the Middle East, and then you have Israel established in forty eight. So, like would, the would indigenous be, population, would it be too simplistic to say like that that Palestinians were sort of renting the land from the Ottoman Empire that was over our, in control, and then the British Empire, so they didn't have legal ownership, but that's a byproduct of colonization. Not that they wouldn't, you know, they very much this was their homeland. This is, the, I mean, you just, you, yeah, you, you've established some, so I'll, yeah, that's, there's, there's, we need to unpack this a bit. So for the most, you know, you, you lived in the land for the longest time and your mm -hmm. family has been there for generations. Like speaking of my family, for example, the Bonora family, mm -hmm. I can count 13 generations mm -hmm. of my family. Like I have the whole tree wow. of us living in Betzahur. So we've been here for generations. We we luckily have we have deeds to the land and we have the property and we can maintain that. Many Palestinians, because of the Ottoman Empire, so back back up. The end of the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was collapsing. It was the aging empire. It was its resources were um, depleted, and you know just the whole kind of Great War with the West and so on. And you know um, the Ottoman Empire tried to get to increase its revenue through taxing uh, its subjects, those it controls in the Middle East. So they devised a plan where, whereby you as a, if you live in the land controlled by the Ottoman Empire, you're supposed to produce and you're, you're supposed to like pay taxes to the empire. As an indigenous population, no taxation of that representation, right? right? This is colonialism. We're not, gonna pay, we're not gonna pay you money. And therefore we're not gonna even record our property. Now, the, the Ottoman Empire was based in today's Turkey. They didn't really have like their tentacles everywhere. They just kind of controlled it. And they couldn't really manage all these things, and they couldn't force everyone to, re to register their land. So Palestinians just continued living there. And some of them had land registered and paid taxes. You know, some of them are good people and like you know, responsible. And some of them, some of, some of them was like, we're not going to pay money, give our hard-earned money, especially as poor peasants living in farmlands and so on. And we're not going to register our land. Um, and refuse to pay taxes to the empire, to the, the foreign powers that control them. Um, so now the Ottoman Empire was like, hey, actually, if actually, you know, the, they figured out what was happening by the indigenous populations, not just in Palestine. This is throughout the Ottoman mm -hmm. Empire, and they basically forced the Palestinian, forced the inhabitants, their subjects, to pay taxes by saying that if you do not cultivate your land over a certain period of time, we would confiscate the land from you. Mm. Uh, so, and that led many people to like register their lands and so on. But then some other people were like, well, you know what? I don't want to do that. So I, I'll just kind of regis register a small part of my property and just declare that as my own property. And I know the Ottomans are not going to really check the details of the property. So I'll just let them know that I have like one acre when I have like 10 acres. So this is like just the practice yeah. of, you know, unorganized, like, in like, controlled occupied pop populations under the empire so this is kind of more of a uh, side note here but became like a lar large point here's the conversation comes israel in 1948 and 67 they take over the palestinian land mm -hmm. in in the west bank and the gaza strip and following like a legal kind of precedent they apply the ottoman rule against the palestinians and they say well hey you your land is not really registered 
Mm. So we're going to take it from you. Or uh, or like we notice you haven't cultivated your land. And especially now Israel has a satellite power and the drones and so on. And they can watch like what's happening. And they can say, well, this was not cultivated in five years. We're going to claim the land. And that's kind of part of what the whole legacy of the conquest of Palestine and Israel maximizing its territorial uh, presence in, in the land. Anyway, so that's kind of yeah. just a large history about like... Um, legal and land yeah, that's and how, no that's really helpful actually that thank you that's yeah, yeah sure that makes a lot more sense um yeah uh, so just to go back to the early 20th century and jewish european migrants start moving to palestine like i said some of them do interested in uh, starting a new life some of them are interested in escaping anti-semitism some of them are interested in in you know driven by a messianic understanding of their life and their faith um but you know, wasn't really widespread, and most Jews were like some of us. Some of them were actually comfortable where they were, and they kind of maintained like we're actually Jews, and we're Jewish Germans, we're Jewish French, and so on. And they they did not buy into that Zionist agenda of transferring to the Middle East. They saw themselves as Europeans. Now that also that fundamentally changed in the 30s with World War II and the anti-Semitism and the Holocaust and so on, which mm. led to a large exodus of European Jews from Europe into. Palestine facilitated by European nations that also had an interest in removing Jews from from Europe. Um, so that led to hundreds, tens and hundreds of thousands of Jews coming into Palestine in the 20s and the 30s, especially. Initially, Palestinian, the inhabitants of the land, the Palestinians, did not have an issue with welcoming Jewish migrants. And they were kind of a bit naive about what's happening. They were not really exposed to the writing of Zionism, like Herzl or Jabotinsky and others who were very clear about their desire to conquest, to take over the land. So and, that real quick, that's a that's an important distinction. So on the ground, it was just kind of like, oh, more, pe- more people are moving into our land and, and we can live yeah. side by side and that's fine. They didn't, but then another, from another perspective, this is in a, a growing conquest that, is happening. That right, would be another right, perspective. Right. Yeah. And those two perspectives are kind of a little bit blurred in a sense on, on the ground. Right. Yeah. So like, you know, you, you, yeah, you're just the average person in the street and you see like some new people in the land and they don't really speak your language, but they're kind of staying together in their own kibbutzes, their own mm-hmm. communities. They come from Europe and they probably bring some resources with them and so on. So like, we don't really mind them. Only later on, it's like, wait, this is actually more sinister. And, and actually Palestinian Christians, um, Kind of were in, in charge of like many newspapers and they were educated and they began mm. this kind of process of translating European um, texts by Jews and in, in 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 from German and whatever into Arabic and that's when we people like freaked out it's like wait they're oh, not wow. just living here because you know there's land and they bought it innocently there's actually something that is happening here so people like Khalil Sekakini Isa Al Isa there was like Palestinian Christian intellectuals at the time who we're at the forefront of like, like basically raising awareness about the issue. Now, there's a lot that happened. There's a lot that happened in the 20s and the 30s, and but basically, Palestinians are getting are becoming more aware of like this Zionist agenda of taking over the land, and some scuffles happened and here and there, and there was a rise of Jewish militias that initially objected to the British rule and like kind of restrictions put on them by the British Empire. Because the British Empire was also interested in kind of figuring out um, uh, uh, a solution for both people and have like a you know uh, an idea of a two-state idea for the Palestinians and the and the Israelis. Jewish militias kind of came a way to like fight against the British and by extension to fight against Palestinians who revolted and rejected um, kind of their their interests. Now, eventually, but the, eventually, the British Empire basically kind of gave up on on Palestine and was really wanted to leave. And there are like issues in India and in Africa, and like the situation in Palestine stopped being like tenable, sustainable for them. Um, and the British and the Jew, and the Jews who were in touch with the British knew what was happening, and they basically um, uh, prepared themselves to take over the land. So you have statements by the founder of the state of Israel, uh, Ben Gurion, the first prime minister at the time, and other Jews who and Zionists were like, "We need to take over the land quickly." The British are getting ready to leave. It's obvious they made these statements in 1947. Especially, they took the issue to the UN. Um, with what is called the partition plan to try to like uh, divide the land among the Palestinians and the, and the Israelis. 
Um, I don't know how you would feel uh, about it, but when a colonial power that controls you takes your issue to the UN and have the UN decide what happens to your property, mm. you're not going to be you're not going to be okay with that, right? Like if someone comes to your land, it's like to your house and say, "Hey, I'm I struggled." over there can i stay at your room and you say please come and he's like i'll pay your rent that's fine but then that issue eventually that issue becomes well actually now i'm gonna go talk with the empires of the time the us and britain and so on and we're gonna take your house from you or half of it and kind of trap you in trap you in the basement or in your bathroom you're not gonna be cool with that that's not right that's not gonna work it's a very reasonable response and palestinians were keenly aware of the British Empire and its divide and conquer policy and its like objectification, subjugation of the indigenous populations. Palestinians rejected that plan at the same time. time I'm sorry if this is long winded, but hopefully it's interesting. Uh, it is but to then me. The, so I, I, if people okay, are good. interested, they could, they could change the channel. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. So yeah. <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> and then by '47, the Zionist militias at the time, the Ergun and the Haganah got to, together and there was this plan called Plan Dalet, D-A-L-E-T. People can look it up, which was basically the strategic military plan by the Zionists at the time to take over Palestine. And basically it's a tactic of transfer. We need The land is populated by Palestinians throughout, by Arabs throughout. We need to find a way to kick them out so that we can establish our Jewish homeland. So they they initiate Plan Dalit in forty seven, which is basically what the Palestinians call the Nakba, N A K B A, or the Arabic word for catastrophe. Mm. And they began very brutal campaign of ethnically cleansing Palestine from the Palestinian its Palestinian populations uh, through. Who, who was? I mean, the the, the, the Zionist Jewish... militias. The, the Zionist G- militia. Okay. Oh, wow. Zionist militias that eventually were coalesced into the Israeli military today. But these militias, the Haganah and the Ergun and others, went over went to Palestinian villages and basically massacred them. So you can talk about um around I think 40 massacres were committed between 47 and 48. So for example, Dar Yassin, Lifta, Kufur Biraim, um Ailabun, uh, I just mentioned, so two of these, Ailabun and Kufur Baram, I don't know if it matters to people. I think it should, at least. These were Christian villages in the north mm. of today, that is the Galilee, North Israel today. And these were predominantly Christian villages and they were ethnically cleansed. They removed all of the Arabs there through the bombardment or through attacks or through massacres committed. Dar Yassin is the most famous massacre committed, yeah. where like, you know, tens of Palestinian farmers were like lined up and shot. Now that led to the beginning of what is called the refugee problem for Palestinians. Um, D- Daniel, can so, I ask a question? And, and it, I, I, yeah. I, it's it's a it's a it, it could sound offensive, and it's so I. But I <laughs> go for I, it. Go for well, it. Well, well, I in what because I'm just wondering if people are wondering like, well, what like so. They just randomly went in and massacred people, and I think the question mm-hmm. is like, was there any provocation? Like, was there any like, like what would a um, a, a Jewish person living in that era? What would they say? Like, what would their side? Of, is there is there a their side, or was it just a one sided ruthless massacre? Um, why why would they why would they do that? I mean, is it just so? Jewish I'm I'm or? I'm telling you from. I'm sure you can find it. Like I'm sure you can justify it. I'm sure we can justify anything. You, you can well, not justify, you but <laughs> yeah, but exactly. we can either but, way. But no, but I'm serious. Like you yeah. can give a reason to say, well, oh, you know what, the Arabs did this, the Palestinians did this, mm-hmm. so we had to do this. Like I'm sure you can, you can say that, and be, and people make that argument today. I'm I'm trying to frame mm-hmm. it, and as is evident by the writing the writings of Zionist Jews from the late 19th century up to the. 30s and the 40s, and I mentioned people like uh, Ben Gurion, mm-hmm. Jabotinsky, and others were very clear that they that they need to establish a Jewish homeland, mm-hmm. and that that Jewish homeland is occupied by Arabs, and we need to find a way to rid ourselves of the Arab and to Arabs and to transfer them out of the land. Like, this is this is a wow. project not just from 40, yeah. the 47 and 48. This is a project from the beginning of Zionism of establishing a whole Jewish homeland. This is the Balfour Declaration. A, a, a 
promised by the British Empire to establish wow. a Jewish homeland, which necessarily means that the Arabs have to go. Did I'm but curious, they, yeah, did they evoke the biblical conquest? I mean, because this has so many parallels, which are oh, I yeah, mean, course, unfortunate course. parallels, right? But yeah. actually, it's, it's not, there's not actual parallels, but I could see somebody saying, this is, we're doing it all, we're, we're yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, kind of like, the, can, kind of like mean, how the Europeans did when they settled in the land we now call the United exactly. States of America. I mean, exactly. Manifest destiny. Yeah, the, yeah. The U.S. is called the promised land in early yeah. writings. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, like you, the, I mean, this is, we can talk about that, about this, but yeah, the Bible has consistently been used to justify whatever you want. <laughs> From slavery <laughs> so, to... I'll have Congress you back on the Palestine. podcast so we could get, go, <laughs> go into that. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, even today, like now we have Christians in the U.S. saying, well, the word Hamas is Hamas in, in Hebrew, and it's mentioned in Genesis 6, and it means this and this. Like, it's ridiculous. You can, mm. the Palestinian theologians say the, the Bible is like a bazaar. You go to the bazaar and you pick whatever you want and you just, you know. <laughs> This is what I want. I want this apple. I want this uh, banana. I mean, you can find yeah. anything in the Bible if you want, if you're looking for it. Yeah. It's like a supermarket for you. Um, no, but like, yeah, I'm sure at the time, like, especially when you see this increase of Jewish presence in the land, it's like, I'm sure some people, some Jews would say, oh, this is reminiscent of, reminiscent mm. of our conquest of Canaan. This is reminiscent of, yeah, maybe the messianic, maybe the Messiah isn't like a, a specific person. Maybe the messianic, Messiah is actually the messianic age period of time where the nations would look favorably and we they'd let us enter like i don't know i mean i'm sure you can sure i'm, I'm i won't be yeah. surprised if that synthesis was at play as well but i'm just saying that the zionists at the time including ben Gurion and others were not really interested fundamentally in the establishments of the the establishment of the fortunate you know the fortunes of israel as much as it's in, in establishing a homeland for the jewish yeah. for european jews okay. um that's helpful. There's a lot of nuance. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of nuance, and I'm obviously giving giving you like a um, a crash course in this. This is not yeah. to be analyzed in ten minutes. There's a lot to <laughs> unpack, but that's kind of the the general kind of the main contours of what's been happening in the land. Yeah. Um. Well, so I, I I did look up the Der Der Yassin massacre. Um. Mm -hmm. So it was April 9th, nineteen forty eight, and I believe it was um a hundred and seventeen people massacred. Right. Um, women, children. There was some ev um, disputed evidence of even like brutal, like like rape and like. I mean, it was a massacre. Mm -hmm. It was a massacre at the very least, and and some of the details, right. you know, up for debate. But uh, yeah, that that and that's very that seems very public. That's not like you said. You're giving your. I appreciate you in in endearing my question that could sound offensive. Like, what did the other? You know, <laughs> I, I don't. I yeah. you know, I'm just, I I can sense other people maybe wondering that, but as far as I can see, there's no real debate. This was an atrocity. Um, yeah, no, this yeah. is, I know this might be shocking to some people, but this is like, this is fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not using like, I'm not using like, um, like bombastic or like charged language here to, uh, about describing what's happening. And honestly, I'm using the language that was used by Israeli historians okay. themselves. So if you want to look this up right now, Ilan Pape, I-L-A-N-P-A-P-P-E, the book is the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Mm. Like that's just the the name of it. And you have other historians like Benny Morris. These are Israeli historians who yeah. had access. I think in the early two thousands or the nineties had access to declassified documents from the IDF. And then they discovered they sold this narrative initially. Well, this is you know Arabs were bad and so on, and you know we mm. fought them and we won. But then the, the the declassified documents revealed the extent of this kind of just violent and aggressive campaign to rid the land of the Palestinians. So anyone who is like, finds my language problematic or they want mm -hmm. more context, please. Yeah. Ilan Pape, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Also Palestine, the Palestinian historian, Nur Masalha, N-U-R Masalha, mm -hmm. M-A-S-A-L-H-A, -A wrote about this, Benny Morris, an Israeli historian. This is, this is not a disputed fact. I think right. people have a problem with the technical term ethnic cleansing. But okay. it, this falls within the legal definition okay. of ethnic of ethnic cleansing, which is to render certain areas ethnically cleansed from a certain like from a certain ethnicity. Like uh, that's just like the legal definition that is accepted, and there is no dispute that this was a an, um, a premeditated effort by the Zionist militias to to empty the land of Palestinians to to create a Jewish homeland, and not just Dar Yassin. I mentioned Lifta also in Jerusalem, Ayla Boon, Kufan Baram, and if you just look up ethnic 
you know, depo- depopulated villages, depopulated mm-hmm. villages in Palestine in 48 and 47, you can find like a list of like tens of these. And this is not disputed. And this is not just in the villages, also in like big cities like Nazareth, like Tiberias, like Haifa, all of them have legacies and stories um, of the removal of Palestinians. Some of them through massacres, to be fair, not to like paint a, a very wide brush here. Some of them were clear massacres, but you just commit one massacre and like everyone around you would freak out. It's like, mm-hmm. well, wait, they're coming for us next. We're next to Dar Yassin. We better get out of here. Wow. And and that's what's led to the refugee you know, crisis. Some of them were massacred. Some of them were bombarded. Some of them, the, the Jewish militias came to them. Like I know this in, in the Galilee area of, of these kind of Christian villages, like in Kufur Bar'am, they bombed them. They came to them and like, hey, if you stay here, we're going to bomb the whole village. And you have 10 minutes to leave before we bomb the village. And Kufur Bar'am, for example, was bombed by the Jewish Jewish militias. And they escaped now. And so I, I got to visit Kufr Bir'am in the north, and it's very close to Lebanon. And now its people mostly went to Lebanon and became refugees. These are Christian refugees, mm. Palestinian Christian refugees who now live in Lebanon in refugee camps as a result of this. And this is throughout historic Palestine. Um, anyway, I think we spent a lot of time yeah. about this because I'm, I, I think the interest here now is Hamas. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you want to unpack a lot of what happened in '48 to now <laughs> that's let's, 75 years yeah well let, yeah, let's ahead, ahead. um maybe let's give a quick overview because i think all that all that background because i think a, a lot of us in the west have a de- should have a decent knowledge of kind of 48 onward we typically know when you say the 67 war the six days war and right. stuff and we, we 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 have a general idea of that so we yeah let's let's give well in, in real quick 1948 i i when i lear- learned about 1948 it was the war of independence that right. term feels now it feels very problematic, but um, yeah, let's begin there yeah. and, and get to the present day. How's that? Yeah, whose whose independence is it? Right, like <laughs> the American Revolution. It's the American independence, but it's really like the. I'm not the expert here, so maybe I should not say this, but it's because the colonies just rejected taxation. Mm-hmm. And I think because slavery was banned and the British tried to stop slavery and, and George Washington did not want to give up his slaves or like Americans did not want to give up the slaves. I think they were denied to go west of Pennsylvania. Maybe I don't know if this is like, I don't know. Yeah. Was, but, but like, yeah, you, you call the war of independence, but you're the British are like, what are you doing? We're just, we're taxing you because we, we need to collect taxes and you cannot own slaves anymore. Mm. You know, it's not like the King George the Third. You know, like viewed what what happening is independence. He he saw this as a mutiny against the the legitimate you know mm. c- government that controlled the land. But we call it independence now, and like obviously makes sense. But yeah. Um, yeah, Israel calls it independence. Palestinians call it the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of all Palestine, the erasure of Palestine, the displacement of more than seven hundred thousand Palestinians. We didn't mention this earlier. Oh my word. But you have this huge exodus of the Palestinian populations from Palestine into becoming refugees. And most of them most of them went across the land to Jordan. That's where the militias kind of forced them out, forced them to Jordan or to Egypt or to Lebanon and to Syria. And some of them moved into the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And this is important because that's the context of Hamas. Um and, and they continue to be refugees. Now, 700,000 Palestinians 75 years ago is 5 million refugees today. And they continue to be refugees, continue to be uh, stateless people who have a right to the land. This is a UN resolution, um, I think 194, that guarantees the refugees a right to return. So this is the Palestinian right of return, saying that those who left the land in 48 have a have an undisputed uh, right to go back to their land. Ukrainians who escaped the war in, in Ukraine right now have a right to go back to Ukraine when the war is over. The same thing with Iraqis or Syrians, anyone else. You have a you have a right to return to your homeland. Palestinians have that right on paper as guaranteed by international law. Seventy-five years later, they continue to be in refugee camps in Lebanon, Syria, and a large population in Jordan and in the West Bank. So, for example, Bethlehem, where I'm from, has three refugee camps: uh, Aida, Dhesha, um, and the third one. Uh, I forgot the name now, but anyway, and these are refugees. Aida, Aida, 
Um, Wait, am um, I understanding this correctly? So, so you're saying to d- the so seven hundred thousand refugees back in the wake of forty eight, and that's still there's they're still in camps today. Yeah, so they're not in tents. The yeah, refugee camps, camps look mean, what a yeah. It looks like a, what a refugee camp would look like seventy five years later. Like they eventually were able to get bricks and get some money and build their own kind of shacks. The camps look like slums, like anything else. So if you go to Bethlehem and you go to Aida, it's just a very densely populated, poor area of the refugees, of the descendants of refugees. Wow. Um, so, but yeah, you can like look at you can look up what a refugee camp looks like today, and you can see it. Like you can Google search the, it. So okay, yeah, so um, from 1948 till today. Let's let's go there. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, I can. We can include some like references in the show notes uh, for people to like look up these these everything I'm saying and verify it and just mm-hmm. if they want to just study more about the history I'm like I think I think people need to do their due diligence yeah. it's sad that you now people are interested in this conversation because of what happened you know right. uh you know in the last 10 days it's it's this is 75 years and this is supported by the US and we can talk about this but it's kind of really like hurtful to me that now we're paying attention that Israelis were killed and we can talk about violence and killing and so on, especially what's happening right now in Gaza. But it's about time, you guys. Just out there for you. Um, this is a rebuke to not just you, Preston, to everyone else. <laughs> 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 in love, in love, I say. Um, but especially because we're complicit in this, because the U.S. supports what's happening there, because it's unconditional four billion dollars a year go to israel to maintain the occupation of palestine yeah. but we can talk I, about that in a bit for what yeah. it's worth my in, i lived in israel outside of jerusalem mm. for four months in 1999 and i've had yeah a growing interest in the conflict and always wondering yeah. well what okay nothing happens in a vacuum so like right people don't right. just wake up one day and say because there was always a fear we'd take the bus into jerusalem it was always like there's always that little bit of a nervousness because there's, you know, periodic suicide mm. bombers, you know, and they blow up buses. In fact, one of the buses on our route uh, a couple years later was was blown up. Like, I, and I could have mm. been on the bus, you know. Um, mm. yeah. And so, but it's like, well, wait, but and even then, but this is 1990, I was, what, in my early 20s, bathed in all right. kinds of certain ideologies and everything, you know. But yeah. even then, I'm like, well, wait, yeah. wait, yeah. I don't know. Do people just wake up one day and say, I'm going to go bomb up? Like, why would they? Why would they do that? That's evil, period, full stop. Right. Um, but that doesn't, people don't just come out of the womb wanting to blow up buses. So like, I've I've had a, yeah. a 20 year lingering interest in wanting to peel back the layers of this conflict because I'm I'm so right. bathed in one, kind of largely one side of yeah, yeah. the understanding. Um, yeah, yeah, you yeah. went to Israel, you did not go to Palestine. Yeah. I mean, you, if you want to go to Israel, you can have a completely different experience than if you go yep. meet yep. with Palestinians. Like, you know, actually not, you know, go to, not just like go to a certain geography in the land, mm-hmm. like actually see, identify the areas and the people in the land that give you a completely different story mm-hmm. and narrative and perspective than you do if you go just to Israel or, you know, but right. just depends on your agenda and, and you can I, like identify there was a certain kind of prejudice that you can, or bias that yeah. you kind of carried that influenced the way you had to view the land. Mm-hmm. But also you were curious about like, Hey, well, there's something off here. Like I need yes. to like unpack this. And you have the fortunate opportunity to even go there. Like the vast majority of Americans haven't been there. And, right, and right. fundamentalists and conservative Christians <laughs> already have their preconceived ideas about the land and and mostly driven by Islamophobia, ignorance, xenophobia, and just a, an old tired trope, mm-hmm. that binary trope that sees you as a good person and those who oppose you or those who look different, those who speak a different language or different religion or profess a different religion to be bad and wrong and so on and so forth. And that, yeah. I think, is very prevalent today still, continues to be. Um, yeah, so do you want to just kind of unpack 48 to sure. today, yeah. Yeah. which is also a lot. Yeah. Um, so Israel was established in 48, 700,000 refugees. A lot of them move out of the land. Like I said, there today there are five million refugees that are still stuck in refugee in refugee camps. Some of them like were able to uh, be naturalized and assimilate, but the vast majority continue to be refugees in refugee camps with like refugee cards. 
Um, there was a ceasefire in 49 after the war, which basically established Jewish-Israeli control over 80% of historic Palestine. And then uh, the Palestinians were trapped in two areas, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And the West Bank included East Jerusalem. So that continues to be under like where the Palestinians uh, were living. Of course, there continue to be Palestinians in Israel. So like I said, we still have a, a good chunk of Arab Israelis or Palestinian citizens of Israel, like for example, in Nazareth and Haifa and so on. Um, but the ma majority of them were left, like were taken out. Um, so the Armitage line, or what we call the Green Line of 49, d divided the land into Israel, and then the West Bank con came under Jordanian control, and then the Gaza Strip came under uh, Egyptian control. Mm. Uh, looking for as a you know transitionary kind of position until we can figure out what to do, you know how to move forward with this uh, situation. Um, and that continued, a stalemate continued until 67. There were some efforts to try to figure this out and a two-state solution kind of idea came about. In 67, um, Israel basically invaded the rest of the land. So they took over the West Bank and they took over the Gaza Strip and took over the Golan Heights, which is belongs to, Israel, to Syria, which continues to be occupied illegally by Israel against international law and UN resolutions, and also took lands from Lebanon, which continues continue to be controlled by Israel, the Shaba fields in, in Lebanon. They had to give some of them back in 2006, but they still control some land. So Israel, for the indigenous population, think of the Palestinians or the, just the indigenous populations of the, of the whole region, this is an, a colonial imposition by European Jews who came to our land, driven by an ideology motivated by Christians, by Christian Zionism, that was trying to find a solution to a European problem of anti-Semitism and Holocaust. All of it within the framework of colonialism, within the, the framework of anti-Semitism, oppression, colonization of people. Right. This is the whole us as Palestinians and, and Arabs and Jordanians and Egyptians and everyone you talk to in the region. This is a context. This is a story of colonization. This is some people coming from overseas, taking over our lands. Um, and Jews can claim, well, yeah, we have a claim to the land, you know, our history, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But for, for me living today, 4000 years after Abraham, like, what are you doing? Like coming to my land and you expect me to like sing kumbaya with you no of course i'm not gonna accept this palestinians rejected this in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and and palestinians continue to, to reject this and most arabs most arab people like at least like in the region see it as what it is is a colonial project of taking land for power and for and, and 48 is a prime example of this the ethnic cleansing of palestinians and 67 is a continuation of this and even i failed to mention this and even israel took over took over the sinai went right, throughout yeah. the Egyptian Sinai. So like Israel was expanding. It's not just two state solution, you know, let's let's you know, let's get along, let's be friends and let's be neighbors. No, this is a, you're expanding. You're going to Egypt and you're going to Syria and Lebanon and taking over the whole land. Now this might be driven by some kind of biblical understanding that you wanted to claim the land that was promised to Abraham from the Nile to the Euphrates and then hey, if you can take the Sinai, you can take Syria. Next thing you know, you're in Iraq in the, by the Euphrates. But any any reasonable person, well, there's a theological conversation to have to be have about the land, and maybe we can have this on a different episode. But we're not gonna be we're not gonna be okay with this, right? So, mm -hmm. so Arabs fought and Palestinians fought, and we rejected. We see this as a colonialism and oppression, and and it's a very similar story hopefully people can relate to this to the natives of the americas the first nations the native americans the aboriginals in australia mm -hmm. indigenous populations sitting there you know minding their own business and then europeans come and take their lands from them and you you brutalize them you call them savages you kill them and then you push them into concentration camps or reservations or what or what have you and that's a legacy of colonialism that palestinians were aware of i understand what western imperialism was and continues to be, and even though we don't, we don't talk about colonialism in that strict sense anymore, but we're aware of post-colonialism, how colonialism continues to work in different sinister and soft ways 
that assert Western slash European slash American power and domination. I mean, so so that's kind of the, that's the discourse of the Palestinians. Real quick, you know, Daniel, on sixty-seven. In uh, excuse my ignorance here, wasn't Israel? Weren't, weren't there other countries, uh, Le- Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, involved in invading Israel or playing a role? Or what was? It wasn't just an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? It wasn't sixty-seven? Didn't it involve other countries too? Or yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I tried to paint the picture that this is not just a Palestine issue; it's right. it's a regional issue. When when Israel, from its get-go, seems to be interested in maximizing its territorial like control, we're gonna freak out. Like we're not mm-hmm. gonna be okay with it. Like just the fact that you took over the majority of Palestine in forty-eight, that is a huge problem. Mm-hmm. That you ca- cause an influx of refugees into Jordan and Lebanon and Syria. This is not okay. And and all the people of the land of who surround Israel today, uh, where we're we're freaking out like what yeah. is happening here is this like are they going to take over our countries as well like okay. you know like why would they stop especially with this with the british power and like the military power that they had and the western support for them it's like wait this is like they're supported by israel and the uk and and, and europe we need to step up uh, and we need to fight back okay um so like in 67 uh, 48 as well 48 and 67 like arab armies were in, were involved in the, in the battle um, so, I mean, Palestinians were just decimated anyway, like from under the British control and then under the Jordanian and Egyptian control, they had no power. They had no military power. It was only, it was, they were just arm, mostly armless people. And of course there were revolts and, and scuffles and militias were formed, but for the most part, they're very like powerless people. Um, but like I said, this is part of a larger Arab, Arab concern of this kind of, cancerous entity that came into the land from Europe, taking, taking the land from us and then fighting us and taking. And, and when you take over Syria, parts of Syria and Egypt and Lebanon, I mean, that's clear enough that this right. is a very expansionist colonial project. So Israel um, was expanding and that, that was prior to and that instigated the other nations from responding? It wasn't well, 48, 48, 47, 48 was, were like clear instigation when suddenly they took over the land and they were there were like legitimate concerns of expansion uh ceasefire was established in 49 and then in 67 israel took over more land okay um pre they call it preemptively but and then and then they take war and then more wars happen and then they take more land like if you 67 you take syria and you take lebanon and parts of egypt we're gonna yeah we're we're gonna fight back and so on um yeah, I'm, I don't know how much like to how much time to spend from um, about discussing '67 to like today, but basically the occupation, the Israeli occupation of all of Palestine, could, begins in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Maybe I can pivot from here to talk about Gaza. Yeah, um, and continues to be under a brutal military occupation maintained by the Israeli military. Um, Palestinian militias organize themselves under what is called the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, interested in liberating all of Palestine. And that continues from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. By the 80s, uh, the the head of the PLO, Yasser Arafat, and his posse realize, hey, maybe we need to like figure out like a peace solution here. Like we're not really, we're not going to claim all of Palestine. So they appealed to international legitimacy Yasser Arafat goes to the UN and he says, I have a, I have a pistol in my hand, in one hand, and I have an olive branch in the other. Mm. Do not let me drop the olive branch. He was like saying, we need to like resolve this quickly. This led to the Oslo process um, mm-hmm. to find the, what, we, what is called the peace process, to find an end to the conflict, which is what is called, I said, the two-state solution where we can divide the land between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, this was in 93 was signed. So if you're old enough, you might know the picture of uh, Bill Clinton uh, uh, um, shaking hands with Ishaq Rabin, the Israeli prime minister, and Yasser Arafat, the mm-hmm. Palestinian president. You can look this up. It's like a well-known picture. And, that by, and the, the idea was like by the year 2000, Palestinians would, would be granted a state for themselves in the West Bank and in Gaza Strip with East Jerusalem as its capital. And there are like these kind of last issues to work out, like the refugees and like um, East Jerusalem, what would that look like and so on. But that was kind of the promise and a lot of negotiations happened, but all of them kind of failed. 
Um, and Palestinians quickly realized that they were duped by Israel, thinking that they're actually going to give them some kind of autonomy and self governance. But that was more like basically a big like trick by Israel. Um, and Palestinian, the Palestinian government made a lot of mistakes, kind of uh, with the Oslo Agreement, and this is considered like a very embarrassing and kind of shameful agreement for the Palestinians. Um, fast forward to 2000. Uh, there was a second Intifada, the second Palestinian uprising, and this is when I was a teenager. There was a one uprising in the late 80s, uh, which eventually ended with the Oslo Agreement, which was like this popular, mostly nonviolent um, revolution or resistance um, uprising, uh, even using slogans as no taxation without representation. They mm. threw out their ID cards and they rejected kind of the military and so on and led like to like very cool, awesome kind of popular resistance movements and with large support from like South African allies and others from the US and so on that kind of came along the Palestinians. The second intifada in the 2000s was more aggressive and more militant. Um, Hamas, oh, by the way, Hamas mm -hmm. was established in 1987 funded by Israel to counterbalance the secular left, Marxist leftist um, Palestinian resistance movements. Thinking, following the example of the US and Taliban in, uh, in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. let's support Islamist movements to take credibility and power away from the secular movement. So that's gonna, you know, remember the, and the Taliban and Russia and like how yeah. the U.S. funded Taliban and so on. So yeah. it's like, hey, the U.S. is doing this. Let's do the same thing and let's let's basically fund Hamas. So that led to the founding of Hamas in the late '80s. And this is like this is not like a, a conspiracy theory. Like no, no, no. Yeah. Up, like I read it Israeli on Wiki. I mean, it's a. I mean, not the Wiki. It's a. It's a. You know, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. But it's a fact. Like Israelis, yeah. everyone, like Israeli generals admit this, and that they funded Hamas as a way to like counteract the Palestinian resistance movement of the time. Um, but eventually, Hamas, not to like say what's happening today now is like orchestrated by Israel, but to say that Hamas is a is that monster that Israel created that now Israel cannot control, basically. Okay. But it was it was uh, an attempt to divide and conquer. It's an attempt to um, alienate Palestinians and create kind of faction of power and, and division among the Palestinians. Mm. This is a very classic kind of divide and conquer strategy used by you know you know, whoever is in power, like any empire to like divide the people among themselves. Eventually Hamas went, you know, out of control and, and began, move, you know, attempts of like uh, attacks, militant ex attacks in the nineties. And in the two thousands, they got more prominent and kind of were responsible for some suicide attacks and so on. But basically a sense of exasperation and despair and, and anger at Israeli domination and oppression and also wholesale destruction of Palestinian lives and properties. I mean, hundreds and thousands of Palestinians have been killed. I haven't really emphasized the human um, element here, but we're talking about continual um, disregard for the sanctity of Palestinian life and the killing of Palestinians from 48 until today. Mm. And and we see this happening right now in Gaza. Like, And if you look, if you just look up the... Um, human like the casualties of Palestinians and Israelis over the 20, uh, 20 years or so. It's a very lopsided like mm -hmm. graph, like heavily on the Palestinian side, where Palestinian um, children, women, everyone is killed. I in the two thousands, I have a friend, Johnny, a Christian, who was sniped in the neck and killed mm -hmm. by a sniper because he broke curfew in Bethlehem. My neighbor Atallah, a Christian, also was killed. My cousin shot, another cousin of my dad was shot in, like also, these are all like Christians, was shot in the spine and now is in a wheelchair. Um, and this is just the Christians, like immediate, like relatives of mine. And there's like wholesale uh, killing assassinations of Palestinians in the 90s and the 2000s and so on. Um, and then fast forward to today, kind of the, the reality stays the same of the, the entrenched occupation. In 2005, there was this disengagement plan by Israel to leave, to remove the settlements from, oh, I didn't talk about the settlements, but anyway, Jewish settlements inside the occupied territories. Ex speaking of expansionism, if Israel wants a two-state solution, why are you focused so much on, my, on moving your populations into the West Bank 
and the Gaza Strip at the time and effectively ending the two-state solution. Like, why do you have this consecrated effort by your government to move your population, take over Palestinian land, using Ottoman law to justify taking Palestinian land, including the land of my family in Bethlehem, where we lost um, basically 12 acres of land to, to Jewish settlers, Jews who came from Brooklyn and Poland and Russia and now live in our, my family's land. But Jew, the settlements are also a big problem because Palestinians, just like in the 30s and 20s, they're realizing these are not just our neighbors. These are people who are interested in getting all of us out and taking all of our land. And now we have 800,000 Jewish settlers in the West Bank. Not in Gaza, not with Hamas. This is under the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli you know, peaceful place, which is not. But you have so many of your people against international law because transfer of populations in occupied territory is considered illegal by the Geneva Conventions. Mm. But, you know, why would we care about international law? Um, and, 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 and they're doing this to the Palestinians. And we lost land. And I'm, and I'm like the suffering of my, like my tribe, the Palestinian Christians, is insignificant in, in if we look at the suffering of all of Palestinians and mostly Muslim Palestinians. But anyway, if that... If telling my my story as a Palestinian Christian would would help people understand how this is unacceptable, yeah. hopefully that helps. Um, but ongoing abuse, humiliation, oppression of the Palestinians, a constant um, the building expa- an expansion of settlements, and the chart. And if you look at the charts of like the number of settlers in the West Bank and like over the years, it's like abhorrent what's happening. And systemic violence against the Palestinians. Um, this reality, if I can describe 48 up till 2023, up to October 7th, has been described by everyone, by the Palestinians first, and by Israeli human rights organizations like Bit Salem. And you can look up the documents. Let's make sure we have these in the show notes. And by the most prominent human rights organizations in the world, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and others, and the UN, saying the reality, the lived experience and the reality on the ground from the river to the sea. So all of what I call historic Palestine, Palestine, Israel, is a reality of apartheid, of Jewish supremacy and control and domination over the Palestinian population. This is apartheid similar to what we had in South Africa. In fact, it's not like South Africa. South African friends and prophetic voices like Desmond Tutu, like Frank Chikani, these are you know, big names in, in like Christian Anglican, um, um, yeah. you know, South Africans who fought against apartheid, who came to Palestine. And they're telling us to, to call the situation in Palestine to be apartheid is actually an understatement. Mm. They're telling us that this, the apartheid of South Africa pales in comparison to the reality on the ground right now in Palestine. This is before, this is before Gaza. Where I, I'm not even, let's put Gaza aside. Yeah. This is a reality in the West Bank. This is a reality in Jerusalem. This is a reality in Israel proper of the discrimination against the citizens of Israel. This is a system of apartheid, of one people group that controls the other people group. It's a system of Jewish supremacy and domination and oppression of largely unarmed populations under a very aggressive military occupation. And we can unpack this a lot, and I'm happy to share resources about how the law has been used about this, the nation-state law of Israel that clearly says only Jews have self-determination, and we can talk about the legal, like the legal issues and UN resolutions and international laws that are being broken all the time. We can talk about the cost of life, a discrimination when it comes to water resources, allocation of water. Settlers get way more water than the average. Palestinians get way less water. This talk about land property, about rights of movement, where me as a Palestinian have less rights of movement than you, Preston. If you come as a tourist, you can drive everywhere. I, as a Palestinian, do not have the right to, free, uh, to move. We can talk about the refugees. We can talk about every aspect of the Palestinian life not exaggerating, every aspect of my life as a Palestinian is controlled by the occupation. A system of Jewish control and domination over the Palestinians. I, I do have a, sp- thank you for that, Daniel. And and I, the reason why I wanted to have you on in particular is, is because of your lived experience on the ground, that this is not just an, a, a political issue or mm. conversation. So I, I, um, I, I, I love humanizing and in some way, I love humanizing complex topics and complicating 
easy narratives. So I I appreciate honestly everything yeah, you're thanks, saying. Man. And 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 with you know, I love that you're referencing all the books and stuff. And yeah, I, I wanna say, you know, to the audience, chase down if you want details, you want to fact check, you want to dig deeper, then then it's yeah, let people can do that. I, I do have a specific question about is it 2005 Gaza basically became what some people would describe as similar to or a concentration camp in the sense mm-hmm, that it mm-hmm. was right. um, walled off and people are not allowed to leave. Um, all the water electricity is controlled by outside, I mean, by Israel. Um, and from what I hear, the, even the water is kind of contaminated. Right. Like there's, there's just yeah, layers yeah. and layers. Yeah. 80% yeah. I think are living in br- pretty brutal poverty. Uh, it's the second most densely populated piece, populated part of the planet. Um, and, and I just talked to my kids about this and they're like, well, why, why would they, why, like, why would, why, how come they can't leave or how come this became a walled off concentration camp? What, what would, yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of what you said is probably part of the why, but maybe if, to address that specific question, what, what led to this walled off part of the Israel or Israel Palestine? Yeah. So yeah, how do I? Where do I start? Where do I start? So I, I hopefully I laid out a, a hopefully clear and consistent and fair analysis. Obviously, this is yeah. my sure. position as a Palestinian, not just a Palestinian, but someone who's very critical of of what's happening in the land. And my history, my understanding of Hamas and what's happening in Gaza doesn't go back to ten days ago. It goes back right. to a long durée, a long history. That started in the late 19th century, early 20th century, 48, and the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians and the Nakba, and the continuous, continual kind of occupation and oppression of the Palestinians within a framework of Jewish supremacy and apartheid. So that's a reality on the ground that has not really changed. Like that's how it's always been of Jewish domination of a, a Jewish or an Israeli or a Zionist boot over the neck of the Palestinians. Gaza is just one example of mm-hmm. what what that is, and okay. the this the so there are like you know um, uh, specific is, specific issues about Gaza that makes Gaza the Gaza Strip mm-hmm. the Gaza Strip, but these are accidental. Like the reality is the apartheid, mm-hmm. and what the specificity of the Gaza Strip is only one specific example of other examples of how this apartheid and colonization works itself out. So we have to be aware of this. Like, there's nothing special about Gaza. Mm-hmm. It's only special in its like in its accidental features, but it's okay. part of a large problem um, that exists throughout all of the land. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll talk about violence and the sure. Hamas attacks. I would love to talk about that uh, in a bit. Yeah. Um, but basically just to do the history of that, yeah, I mean, everything you described is, is correct and even worse. Like, But what happened in 2005 and 2006, you had Palestinian elections. Palestinians okay. were fed up with the Palestinian government. That was seen so that this is a PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, that formed itself, including many parties, that formed the Palestinian Authority, that includes many parties, at the exclusion of Hamas. Hamas was seen as an exception. It was seen as, for the Palestinians, as traitors who were basically created by Israel and, and really deformed and hurt our cause through their violence. However, by the 2000s, Hamas was seen as a clean, as, a, as these resistant fighters, these freedom mm. fighters who were not co-opted by Israel and by the U.S. The, the PA was seen as the, the contractors of the occupation. They're not, they did not provide freedom or justice for the Palestinians, but they basically became the normalizers of the occupation. They, sub, they get their legitimacy, not from the Palestinians, we didn't vote for them at the time, they were kind of issued and justified by the US and the UN and so on. They promised us a solution by the 2000s, they, by the year 2000, that never happened. We actually were duped, they were duped, or Palestinians were duped. Um, and they were seen as corrupt and as basically the hingemen and the contractors of Israel. These are the ones who do the dirty work of the occupation. So the, the occupation, the Israel controls everything, but the Palestinian government has some control over some areas in the West Bank. About 18% of the West Bank is controlled by the PA, and the vast majority of the West Bank is controlled by the military. So it's seven years after the peace process 
Israeli actually control and the settlements continued to expand and the Palestinian government could not do anything. Like they were just basically like failed. Enter Hamas into the picture. We, if, if, if initially we were like shocked, what are you doing? Like, especially in the 90s. In the 2000s, after like the instigation of the Second Intifada by the Prime Minister of the time, Ariel Sharon, Palestinian nonviolent resistance broke out throughout all of Palestine, similar to the first Intifada of the, the 80s. But then Hamas comes to the scene with its own kind of militancy and killing of Israelis. And that for Palestinians was like, wait, this is not our struggle. That's not how we do things. We've maintained a very like radically nonviolent position. Mm. Where it's creative and, and you know um, of you know any like indigenous populations fighting uh, the military and the power, but then at some point it's like we're being killed left and right by the Israeli military in the two thousands. Hamas's violence and killing of Israelis was seen as justified. It's like finally someone is killing is avenging ourselves. I'll give an example of a, of a suicide bomber that I knew of. Who is a ref? Who was a refugee from the Dehesha refugee camp? Um, her name was Iman, which is Arabic for faith. She was engaged to be married. Israel bombed the refugee camp, killed her parents, and killed her fiance. I don't know what you would do. I don't know what I would do. But she eventually went to Hamas, and Hamas was like, "Yeah," and she stopped herself and went to a checkpoint, and she killed like two soldiers. I don't know what leads, and we can talk about Hamas and violence, not to justify what they did, but to give some context of this long oppression of the Palestinians and massacres, not not to use the word hyperbolically, but attacks and killing of Palestinians on a daily basis by the tens in the 2000s. Hamas came out like, you know what? They're going to kill us, we're going to kill them, and we're going to kill ourselves by killing them. And these kind of the rise of the suicide attacks by Hamas and comes as a sense of despair and like hate and 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 just like like trauma like ongoing trauma for 75 years we keep sex, we see we keep failing we keep getting attacked we keep getting dehumanized by the israelis and by the silent silence of the international community that is more concerned about apologizing for its own abuse of the jews of historically than standing up to standing up to justice, and like Palestinians were like, you know what, screw this, we're going to take this in our own own in our own hands. And then Hamas, ex- especially, excelled at you know these suicide attacks that were very effective, like right on paper. That oh look, we're killing ten Israelis, twenty Israelis, you know. And for some Palestinians, well, you know what, like we've been brutalized and murdered left and right. This is this is they deserve this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Now in that. At the time, still, is Hamas was functioning as a militia that was outside of the larger Palestinian political project of liberation. Um, but then, by the 2005 and six, they were we had elections, and the U.S. pushed for elections, and and Hamas won the elections, the parliamentarian elections, basically. Um, not the government, like the, the Mahmoud Abbas, the current president, won the presidential elections, but the majority of the 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 parliament was um was was hamas was won by hamas real so quick, this was a real huge... quick daniel because that that that's an important point because i have heard people say well when people try to say well there's palestinians and then there's hamas and then people say you know like let's make sure we divide these two but then i've heard they're like well hamas was democratically elected so the average palestinian is actually supporting hamas but you're giving the context i'm hearing you say is well that is also related to the what they would see as the very much of the failure of the authorities that were in charge prior to Hamas right. coming in to right. be, right. be right. in charge. Okay. Right. Yeah. If if an, if if um, yeah. If if an, an Israeli Apache um, or a tank like blows up a Palestinian home and like kills like five six people in a refugee camp, uh, yeah. Why why wouldn't an, uh, why wouldn't a Palestinian blow up themselves in a bus or whatever? You know, like um, yeah. But but. Yeah, but they did not have really support from the Palestinian from the Palestinians as a militia group, but as candidates who presented themselves at the Palestinian parliamentarian elections, these are like people like we're standing against corruption, we're we're refusing the how the PA was co-opted, and we need your vote. And Palestinians were like, well, between a, a, a corrupt Palestinian government a PA official and between this person who is 
uh, promising um, um, honesty and to, to struggle for Palestine and to not be bought by the by the Israelis. I'm going to vote for this person. So it was a more um, more of a move. Yeah, we need to have a replacement of this corrupt government. And the Hamas was the only kind of strong option. There were many strong options. And like I, when I voted in these elections, I mean, I, I voted for like leftist parties, you know, like that were not kind of not part of the PA, or at least saw, saw them sensible replacements. Um, I kind of voted for a guy called Mustafa Barhouthi, an incredible intellectual in Palestine and so on. Um, but anyway, they they won, they won the majority of the parliament. Eventually, stuff happened, and there was this kind of this mini civil war between the Palestinians, between Fatah, the PLO, and um, one of the parties of the PLO, and Hamas. And eventually, Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, and the PLO, PLO was kind of uh, pushed into the West Bank. Right. And that led basically Israel to make a decision. They pushed for democracy by the U.S. Let's have democracy in Palestine. And then Hamas took over. Hamas won the elections. Well, this is the Palestinians' fault. They have control in the in the Gaza Strip. We need to control them. We can't really trust mm-hmm. them. They're not part of our project in the PA to have these contractors. They're not going to be like submitted to our system. So we need to make sure that we keep them in check. So that led to the disengagement plan, where where Israel moved its soldiers and its settl- settlers from inside of the Gaza Strip into the outside, creating what you described aptly as a concentra- concentration camp where Hamas, who mm-hmm. was elected in 2004 and five, so 20 years ago, still maintains its power. Now, that is not to say that there is a support for Hamas today. Actually, I can share the article with you. I just kind of read it. The vast majority of Palestinians reject Hamas, and especially in Gaza. Like The mm-hmm. situation in Gaza is horrible. Like. While Palestinians are aware this is a product of the occupation, but their lives are terrible, and like they blame Hamas that put them in this place, and the and the vast majority of Palestinians in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem are not fans of of Hamas. It's militancy. It's like fundamentalist kind of religious ideology. Palestinians are not like cool with it, but this is kind of held in tension with like. But they are still they're not bought, and they're actually fighting Israelis, and they're actually resisting the occupation versus those who were co-opted by the occupation forces. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. There's, I mean, it's not an easy issue. It's not an easy choice. Like, who do you choose, right? Like the yeah. corrupt or the violent? And I, and, I, and, I, is, yeah. and I just want to add, I mean, it's so obvious to me, just to make sure it's obvious to everybody else, that like, you're not just, def- you're, you're explaining and giving right, context right, right, yeah. to stuff. It's not like you're yeah, justifying, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, I'm just giving the context and the Palestinian Christian position and my position is radically nonviolent and ra- and rejects Hamas in in from its ideology and what it says and it's also from its behavior. It's like horrendous. And if you're speaking about the attacks, I mean they're heinous and they're, they're disgusting and they they hurt the cause more than anything else. And there there is like some kind of strategic well, hey, this is like Hamas is like shaking up the world order and like they're destabilizing Israel and Israel is now perceived as weak. It couldn't defend itself. And for like some people it's like, ha, well, Israel, well, Hamas just showed how corrupt and how weak uh, Israel is. And like, it could be like, seen as a symbolic victory that the militias were like, able to do something to Israel where no one else could do this. Like this has, you know, like they're describing this, like the worst attack on Jews since the Holocaust. Like this is for some people, it's like, this is insane. Like what? Um, but like, there's no justification for like what happened. It's heinous and it's disgusting. And and like I said, it harms um, the Palestinian cause more than anything, and and obviously led to the wholesale destruction of Palestinians and and death like in the last ten days in Gaza Strip. Um, hey, can I ask a question no, on that? And I, I, yeah, I, um, Hamas the the attack the October seventh uh, the Hamas attack. Mm. They, they knew. That Israel was going to respond with ten times the vengeance oh, yeah. and kill loads of yeah. children and innocent people. They they know that, right? So what what's and I don't expect you to maybe go in, like what's going through the mind of Hamas when they're like, <laughs> our children are going to be slaughtered if we do this. So we're like, I don't what? Know, man, I don't know. It's it's vile and it's yeah. I don't know. I so one theory that I've heard and and I hmm. I. Is that yes? They know all that, but that would be kind of the price to pay to get international attention and sympathy. When you see a bunch of children being slaughtered in Gaza, which they knew was going to happen, that's going to, in a sense, kind of garner people saying, "Wait a minute," and draw attention. Like it, like I think a lot of people are saying, 
we weren't actually that aware to our own fault. We as we representing the world or the West yeah. or whatever, like, oh my word, we're not okay with children being slaughtered in retaliation. That the yeah, take care of Hamas, or whatever, but the way to like retaliate against Hamas is not to kill children. Like that's not Yeah, I I just do not think that Hamas expected that they could cause so much damage. I don't think these are like guys who went on motorcycles and they just went around and like, man, the whole thing is so confusing. How did they break out of the jail? How did they break out of the concentration camp? The border is the most secure border in the world. Like yeah. Trump and his friends are like, look at Israel. Look how, how Israel is successful. We need to emulate Israel. You want to tell me that the, mili the Hamas militias went into Israel for six hours before any military person yeah, would show up? That. The most secure, like they have, um, I heard like Jewish, um, not Jewish, Israeli, or well, Jewish, Israeli, um, veterans talking like who served at the the gaza border they're like we have underground sensors anyone who come even comes close to the border is going to be notified they have like automated machine guns with ai that can shoot at anyone who come close to them oh my word. you know they have cameras one, one person was saying like we watch four of us watch the screens for four hour like stints just watching the screens on on and on what do you mean you they wow. like you see the footage of like them with a bulldozer coming and opening the fence and like walking through and dancing. How is that possible? So I, I, I don't want to, I, I don't know. This is confusing to me. How does like, how does that happen? I shudder to think that this was coordinated between Israel and Hamas. Like I just, just like blow my mind. And I just like, like, I just like, I don't know how to think about this. Um, but I just, I don't think Hamas was aware that it could do this. Um, was Iran something in, people are theorizing that, off with all of this? And, yeah, no, yeah. I, I say, I think a lot, everybody I listen to is like saying the same thing. Like this doesn't make yeah. sense and, yeah. and we can, lots of conspiracy theories. We can, you know, I think one conspiracy yeah, sure, theory sure. was, you know, Netanyahu is so unliked by the people that, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. something like this could garner support if he, I, yeah. and I don't even, I, sacrifice, sacrifice his people yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and then take over the Gaza Strip and then, yeah, I mean, yeah. Is, anyway, is, I, is I, don't want, I don't want to deal with that. Right. I don't want to. I, I let the conspiracy theorists deal with this, but it's yeah. very troubling and very confusing. And I would love for us to get some information. Like, how did this happen? All I would say, Hamas went through, and I don't think I think they would have expected some quick resistance from the Israeli military. They would not have been able to cause so much damage. I, but then they went through and they did what they did, and it's heinous and it's disgusting. I don't know what they were thinking. I think they were thinking that taking um, taking hostages would help. So the first, when this happened on Saturday, and I don't know how much of this stuff makes it to the West, but Hamas's response, we took hostages and we're treating them well, but we did this so that we can trade them with Palestinian hostages or Palestinian prisoners. Israel calls them prisoners for the Palestinians. These are hostages taken by a foreign country. We didn't represent, they're not our country. And they take them from their homes and they kidnap them and they put them in jail without any due process. And for the Palestinians, um, these are political prisoners kidnapped by a foreign country. And Hamas th thought that by taking arresting civilians and prisoners of war, they can use that as a bargaining chip to get prisoners, Palestinian prisoners out. I don't, they assume that having, I don't know, I don't want to like explain Hamas. I think I don't want to do that work, but they assume that because they have the hostages in the Gaza Strip, they thought that Israel would think twice about bombing the Gaza Strip. And as far as what we can, what we know, at least what Hamas had said, so far 22 Israeli hostages were killed by the bombing. So they were like, "Hey, they, I don't think Israel is going to bomb. They can't, don't really know what what's happening in Gaza. Let's see if we can use this as a bargaining chip." They released a video of an Israeli French woman who spoke in the video. Yes, yeah, was that. like, "Hey, I'm I'm treated well, but I need to get out of here." And I think, and, and Hamas, I think two days ago came came out and saying all of the foreign foreign nationals we have, we want to give, we want to we want to let them out. These are our guests. Not that I want to like humanize yeah. them, or I want to humanize anyone, but not to like make them into angels. They're not angels, but they're saying these are we're not our fight is not with the French or the Americans. We need to send these out. Our issues with the Israelis. And these are our guests for now. And whenever the opportunity uh, presents itself, we want to take them out of the Gaza Strip. I don't think Israel is interested in this. And they continue the bombing of the Gaza Strip right now. But anyway, so 
before we ta- talk about this and unpack this and unpack violence and this, yeah. hopefully the last conversation for the hour and a half or, or so or longer gives some understanding of what's been happening there. That Hamas is part of an, a group of Palestinians who believe in the armed struggle, that there is a justification for you as an occupied people to respond to violence by violence, to respond to militancy by militancy. When Israel is the only nuclear power in the world, when it is the strongest military in the Middle East, when it has been killing and brutalizing Palestinians and Gazans for the last 75 years, this year alone, um, in the West Bank, not in Gaza, putting Hamas aside, more than 300 Palestinians were killed, including 40 children. This is not in the Gaza Strip, this is in the West Bank. The killing of the Palestinians has been ongoing. 40 children killed before Saturday. No outcry, no panel discussions. You did not invite me on a podcast to talk about it, right? This is Palestinians in in the West Bank. And continue what's happening, and also to mention what's happening in East Jerusalem and the Aqsa compound or the Temple Mount, the settler rampages in the West Bank, um, the, what happened in Hawara, I don't know if you know about what's happening in Hawara, there was like a, a pogrom that happened in Hawara, settlers went into this Palestinian village and burned it down, like burned church, uh, homes and cars and killed Palestinians, like supported by the Israeli military. And you can talk about settler militias and settler violence in the West Bank. Like it's been a very atrocious year to the Palestinians up until what happened last Saturday. So violence and desecration of of Muslim holy sites and killing of Palestinians left and right. And then you have a very neo-fascist racist government in Israel right now. And just horrible stuff from people being said by that government that is horrendous. And if anyone else who said it, if it wasn't an Israeli, it was like it would be largely condemned. But their Israelis. Can I ask you a so, question? But that um, is the and the last point. I'm sorry. And and then yeah. the last point. And also, 75 years of trauma and hurt and abuse. 75 years of refugee ca- refugees stuck in refugee camps. 70 percent of Gazans are refugees. Mm. And the Gaza Strip over the last 16 year- years of a blockade, thousands of Palestinians were killed. Again, to give context to what's the current wave of, of violence, and let's not be myopic and like narrow-minded in how we think about it. Uh, if I was like a 23-year-old Gazan, I went through five wars uh, from being a kid until today. Maybe, again, maybe my dad was killed by a bo- Israeli bombing. Maybe my son, maybe my wife was killed. Do you really, I don't want to use my first first-person language, if that person... Hap- that happened to them. Being in this brutal blockade, and you mentioned the the poverty, the the unemployment, the just decimation of the infrastructure, the eyedropper like method that Israel limits how much calorie, how many calories they eat per day. All of that, you is it really surprising to us that that this environment is not going to breed extremism and violence and hatred? And you're going to tell me that a kid who's who lost his dad or his wife is not going to pick up a gun? And, and attack back. So yeah. and that's kind of the context. And if we're not going to understand Hamas, and if we do not want to understand Palest- the Palestinian struggle, yes, of course, say pure evil, describe an as you wish. But if you want to have any kind of nuance or complexity and be able to hold complexity in your head, in our heart, yes, this is vile. That, yes, what they did was evil. But at the same time, the conditions of the Palestinians are un- intolerable and unsustainable. And and violence breeds violence, and you know, and that's kind of the context that happened here. Anyway, I think I think that point is is made clear here. But yeah, can you, thank you. No, that everything you're saying it 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 helps give context. Um, I, I've got two questions. I'm not sure which one I want to ask first. Maybe, maybe because this is more related to what you're saying. What do you say to people like Russell Moore? Um, mm. And I know you have thoughts about this. Russell Moore wrote an uh, and a huge fan. I I I love. So much of what Russell Moore says, and um, and I know you you have strong admiration for him. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the article he wrote in Christianity Today, I think, captured what a lot of people feel, and and I, I think there was good things or things in the article that make sense. But he, it was a, it was a, it was addressing. He was basically kind of condemning what he called both sidesism. Mm. There is no context here. 
Um, right. maybe he don't, I don't right. want to put words in his mouth, but as, as I kind of can summarize what I remember him saying was basically like what, ha- what Hamas did to all these innocent women, children, civilians um, is pure evil, full stop. Right. There's no right. like, oh, let's right. try to understand we, this whole pod. I mean, you could be accused of giving both sides or whatever. How, how would you be, if you had, if, if Russell Moore, pretend like I'm Russell Moore, like what would you say to <laughs> somebody who's saying, Daniel, it sounds like you're doing the both sides that Russell Moore says is, is just flat out wrong. Right. But okay. So yeah. So he wrote two articles. One of them is like, we need Christians need to support Israel. And then he was aware of how people found what he was saying was problematic. What he said about Hamas was very unhelpful, lacking nuance. And then he used the word justice, which really like aggravated me. Like when I read mm. it in the last paragraph, it's like, um, just to give some context to people, um, more than 3,500 Gazans were killed so far. Mm. Yesterday, um, Tuesday night, um, a bomb, uh, a rocket kind of blew up, and it seems, it seems to be an Israeli rocket that killed 500 patients in in a Baptist in a Baptist hospital. It's run by the Anglican Church, but it's it used to be run by the Baptist, a, like a Christian hospital in the Gaza Strip. Mm. Seven, six, sixty to seventy percent of the vict- the victims, those who were killed, are women and children. Like more than a thousand babies and children were killed by the Israeli military. Um, so wholesale destruction of of um, of everything, just everything. Everything is destroyed. Like white phosphorus is being used, collective punishment, which is a, which is a war crime, denying them basic access to water and electricity. All of these are war crimes according to international law, and it's and it's justified. And Russell Moore and others would justify this using just war theory and all that nonsense. That you know, um, that, but, that violates uh, that violates just. That's not just war. Could, Tar- targeting right. non-combatants is a one of the seven violation of one of the seven criteria. No, but, for, yeah. no, but no, but it's not it's not non-combatants. These are this is collateral damage. They 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 don't they're not humans. They're just collateral damage. Uh, no, we're 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 pro-life. It just but not the lives of Palestinian babies. We're just our own lives. We're not really pro-life. We're just anti-abortion. But but we don't really care about life. Um, uh, so just okay. So took up, and so that was that was like dark, but um, yeah, no, but it's I, really like true, true. Like we can, and you see the apologists, and you see them Christians, and and everyone else, and Fox News, and everyone else. Like yeah, it's, it's well, Hamas's fault. You just blame the victim. It's like I talked with like with with Palestinians in Gaza. I have friends in Gaza. I mean, I haven't really t- talked about this. None of them, like all of them, like. As I was saying, we're not we're not human shields. No one is forcing us to stay. We just we we cannot go anywhere. We're in a we're in a concentration camp. There's nowhere to go for us. But then but then in this discourse, you never hear the Palestinian. You never heard the background of the trauma of the Gazans or the blockade. You just this is where like Russell Moore is like, dude, come on, you 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 need to be better at this pure evil. Like that's all you have to say. There's no context, nothing to say about the Palestinian trauma, occupation, apartheid just pure evil and just like so sloppy and so dehumanizing not just of hamas and like i don't know like they're bad they're awful but um but like what leads people to like make commit such at, yeah. such atrocious attacks like what what's happening is there a like violence if anything it's a it's a sign it's a signal there's something wrong that drives people to this like what what is it but then when you use a blanket statement it's pure evil you're just saying they're not human; they're animals, and this is what Israeli um, mm-hmm. military officials are saying: these are these are animals. I.e., kill them all, mm-hmm. and if if humans, if like civilians, stand in their way, they're collateral, collateral damage. So either way, Hamas or civilians, both of them are animals. Both of them have no dignity, no worth, mm-hmm. no story, no context. And Palestinians are continuously being uh, denied context. To to respond to Russell Moore, um, all you need to do is just have some nuance. Uh, we're not saying um, we're not saying that Hamas is ham- killing, targeting civilians, which which also like not to like question too much of the official narrative, but we don't really know how many of these were uh, like soldiers, how many of these were well, civilians. We don't really have accurate information. There's a lot of propaganda. Israel controls the narrative here, but this targeting of civilians is abhorrent, and I think we have enough evidence to say that Hamas did that. Um, we also have records. We have also reports from 
from Israeli survivors of what happened, saying that the Hamas kept us in homes and the Israeli military came and they bombed everyone. Like I, I just listened to um, a radio interview with an Israeli woman who survived and she was like, the Hamas were just kind of treating us, hum-, she said, humanly. And then the IDF came and then they used a tank and they bombed the house and they killed all the hostages, the Israeli hostages, including the Palestinians. And she was only escaped because a Palestinian Hamas militant kind of helped her to get out. Um, so there's a complication of the narrative and propaganda there. But anyway, I don't want to like I don't want to whitewash anything here. I think what happened was atrocious. But if you just if you want to just give that blanket statement, these are pure evil. Of course, there's no comparison. There are no both sides here because mm-hmm. one is pure evil and one is justified. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying if you Russell Moore just spend some time meeting, talking with a Palestinian, talking with a Palestinian Christian, talking with a Gazan Christian. If you don't want to talk to Muslims, I get it. You don't want to talk to Muslims. They're kind of scary, right? They're, they speak Arabic. Don't talk to Muslims. They're kind of scary to you. Talk to Christian, Christians in Gaza. Try to understand what they're saying. You know, talk to us like Palestinian Christians. We've been talking and shouting at the top of our lungs for, you know, years. Like, try to understand. Pick up a book. <laughs> Pick yeah. up a book about the history of the conflict. Pick up a book by any Palestinian, a, a, a novelist, a, a short story writer. Try to understand something. But if he, in his in his narrow thinking, pure evil versus justified self-defense, of course there's no both sides here. But if you mm-hmm. want to add some nuance, if you want to understand the trauma of the Palestinians, if you want to understand apartheid and ethnic cleansing and Jewish supremacy, there's some... There's some some nuance you can produce, some kind of more critical uh, complexity you can and you can have in your heart. And what Palestinians what Palestinians are saying, you can in the same breath, in the same sentence, without a comma or a period, you can condemn the Hamas attacks on the on the Israeli civilians, and by the same token, criticize what Israel is doing right now. Like it's just, if yeah. your heart goes out to the Israeli citizens, civilians, and your heart doesn't go out to Palestinian civilians, if you're criticizing uh, Hamas and not criticizing uh, what uh, the, the Israeli government, the racist neo-fascist government has been doing for years, if you're not criticizing the objectification and, and oppression of the Palestinians by the Israeli military, and if you're not criticizing the American unconditional support for Israel, it's understandable. You're a product of a white supremacist ideology that sees the Israeli as a human and the Palestinian as subhuman, as an animal. We have, again, like I said this, we have no context, we have no, no story, we have no trauma, we have no you know, discourse, we are nothing. And, and, and that's why Russell Moore felt, oh, I need to mention that Palestinians are loved by God. Like he, he had no mention of Palestinians initially. He had no conception of what, what this is. And this is what breaks my heart. Like if this came out from like a fundamentalist, like crazy, like conservative Christian, like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not surprised by you. But if Russell Moore, who made a very clear moral position against Trumpism and against slavery and white supremacy, he needs to extend the same pro- like critical and nuance in uh, analysis in Palestine. But he refuses mm-hmm. to see this because he's a product of a media machine, of a political discourse that always saw the Palestinians as subhuman who deserve no freedom, no liberty, no justice, no rights. Mm-hmm. And they need to be controlled by the Israeli occupation that we, you and I right now, and all of us in the U.S. are paying for. We are support. We are our tax money is going, has been going for tens of years to support the Israeli occupation and oppression of the Palestinians. Why would Russell Moore like engage with that? He's mm-hmm. part and product of that white of that white supremacist ideology, that consistently not just with Hamas, all of Palestinians that has consistently dehumanized uh, Palestinian people. Yeah, so of course, I mean, he's yeah. he's flat like flat wrong on this. Anyway. What would you say to to the more nuanced position of um, what Hamas did was atrocious, like you said? Mm-hmm. Right. The response killing innocent civilians and children is atrocious. Right. What would you say if somebody says, but between the two, right, right, the Israel's response was instigated so that it's not it's not like Israel woke up one day and said we're just going to shell Hamas or shell these. Gazans live in peace. Like, if Hamas is, is still the blame, the bulk, bulk of the blame is still on Hamas. Um, oh yeah, totally. So that's the the whole just war theory discourse, or the self defense discourse, right? That Israel has yeah. a duty. This is like Blinken and Biden. This is Israel has a duty to defend itself. 
Killing okay, babies um, isn't defending it. That, that, I don't like that. That language is so problematic. Yeah, I, yeah, if, you, if you want to call it justified vengeance, we can talk about that. We yeah, can talk yeah, exactly. about that, but that that's that's <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, yeah. category we. Um, but don't call it self defense. I mean, that's yeah. Not, there's nothing. This is not self defense. This is an ongoing, an ongoing oppression and killing and dehumanization of Palestinians. There's nothing Palestinian. I mean, you're hearing this left and right, and we've always and this is like where the West doesn't get it. We've been like this is there's nothing surprising to me about the killing of like a thousand palestinian kids like this is the same racist ideology from the get-go why is the killing of uh, palestinians in gaza different from the massacres in 48 and 47 mm. why is it different it's the same ideology or why is it 300 palestinians killed in the west bank this year last year last year 2022 was considered the bloodiest year for palestinians wow. over the last 20 years last year <laughs> Did did we yeah. did we talk about it? No. In 2014, a thousand, two thousand, is it a thousand or more than a thousand Gazans were killed? Um, has like has has Israel ever succeeded in rooting out like extremism and militancy from the Gaza Strip by their attacks? Like you think by by okay, let's say that Israel Israel now is gonna eradicate Hamas. Do you think Hamas is dead? Like you can eradicate their generals and leaders and the militants. But what what about the kid who just lost his dad? What why 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 won't he pick up a gun? Like mm. you cannot exterminate uh, um, th this kind of resistance. If and this is like you know this is like simple like hurt people hurt people like yeah. the ter terrorized becomes the terrorizer the oppressed mm. becomes the oppressor. This is just like 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 human nature. Like it's you cannot just. The statement made by like a, a Jewish, an Israeli Jewish, like anti-Zionist friend of, of mine, he said, like, you can never, you should never underestimate people's desire for freedom. You can never underestimate the people's desire for freedom. This is not about Hamas. This is not about militancy eradicating Hamas. This is about a people that has been oppressed. And if we're just, if we're just focusing on Hamas and using Hamas as a, as a justification for whatever we can do, you you're you're missing the completely missing the point which is that the oppression and the 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 you know enslavement of palestinians in the in the whole land the control and domination and upper tide of the palace and ethnic cleansing of the palestinians hamas is not hamas can end as a as a party as a militia but mm -hmm. palestinians palestinians are going to continue to fight back we palestinian christians have adopted a very radical nonviolent position and we can talk about it but and Palestinians at large have also adopted a nonviolent position, whether mm -hmm. it's boycott and divestments and sanctions, mm -hmm. whether it's nonviolent, you know, protests, uh, whether it's like speaking and writing and like the mm -hmm. arts and music and like what we call the creative resistance or the beautiful resistance. Like Palestinians are one of the most creative people in the world in the way how they express themselves and fight against finding humanizing ways to oppose and reject the like fight against the occupation some of us are like we're brutalized and th the only rational response is to defend ourselves in any way is necessary and that includes militancy so uh, the palestinian spectrum of resistance is very wide and diverse but to assume that the ongoing slaughter of, of palestinians is gonna suddenly lead to the eradication of, of militancy is ridiculous. What's going to lead to the eradication of militancy is to, to, to grant people their dignity back, give them freedom, give them justice. And this is the, the biblical understanding that maybe we can kind of, kind of finish our discussion here. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a bibl bibl biblical principle here that is, is given to us by the prophets, by Moses in Deuteronomy and by the prophets in Isaiah and Micah and Amos, about justice, about the the idea of of justice and only justice you should you should you should practice so that you can live in the land to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly. My kids, uh, my son's name is Micah, and like, he mm -hmm. was born in June, and he's like my wife's and I's prayer to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God, and that's kind of our desire for our people. But if there's no justice, there can be no peace. And Israel has this, created this myth and legend here and. The Zionist machine in the West is so powerful that is, everything is fine. It's just those extremists in Hamas. No, this is a system mm -hmm. of oppression. And you think that peace, just like in the Roman Empire, can, can happen when you subdue people. And we're saying you cannot have peace without justice. Justice has to happen. Palestinian rights have to be guaranteed. The end of the occupation has to come. You know, International law has to be upheld. Justice is established. 
Peace is a byproduct. Is you don't pursue peace, you pursue justice. If justice is established, there's no one, no one would would want to pick up an R, you know, a mini, uh, so a, a gun. You live in peace, and then you can have reconciliation. But there's, if they cannot have reconciliation without peace. You cannot have peace without justice. But that's how we need. This is the biblical framework. This is the 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 the, the ministry of Christ, uh, who comes and our understanding of God, who to be on the side of the oppressed. And this has kind of been synthesized by black theologians and African theologians, and the. Pro- preferential treatment uh, or preferential offer, option for the poor, that God is mm. fundamentally on the side of the oppressed. And Christ offers us a way out. In in the Beatitudes, when he, when he says about, talks about those who hunger and thirst for justice, mm-hmm. blessed are they. And then he proclaims his ministry in Luke 4 to be of liberation and freedom and of justice for the world. And of, and then the gospel, the gospel of Christ is this universalization, a beautiful image of the kingdom of God who come, who that comes from within and expands and is have this banquet image of restoration and healing where there's no Jew and Gentile, all are one in Christ Jesus. And all of us are living in that state, that prophetic, what we call the prophetic imagination mm-hmm. where the lion and the lamb lay together where it's when, uh, when nations do not hold their sword anymore, but they beat their souls in, swords into plowshares. That's the biblical image that is consistent throughout the whole text and that is fundamentally shown to us through Christ who rejected violence and oppression and showed us a way of the cross that flips suffering and and flips oppression and injustice on its head and provides a new life and a life more abundant. Um, So that is how we need to think about it um, rather than vindictive just war nonsense that we have used to dehumanize people. Um, I, yeah, I, anyway. I've taken, I, I can't believe how long this is. I, I, th- but, yeah. so I apologize. I do have one more, just, I, it's a question that's been lingering and I think other people are wondering, um, like what, n- not, what would you have Israel to do? So put yourself in, you know, you are Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> Mm. Lost to this mm. attack, and I know all, all the context. I sorry, yeah. I, that's probably really fun. But like, <laughs> yeah. what, what would you for just from a political standpoint, not as a nonviolent Christian, but as a you know, what would what does Israel do? Just nothing, or like, because that's what people are asking when they're like, if the people that are like, I'm against the killing of the Gazan baby. Like this, the whole thing is so messy. But like, I don't what what's the uh, what should they do? Like, just let, well, I I yeah. yeah no that's yeah that's that's fair. Um, yeah, I think I. I try to answer that question previously. Oh, you're talking about like right now. What should what should right? Yeah, more do? right now. Not not yeah. More right now. Um, yeah. I guess what should yeah, they do? I mean, you know, two state whatever and free the. I mean, there's <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. The end of the occupation and the whatever yeah. the two state or one state solution. We can talk about that. Um, yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I, I think if there is any statementship, if there's any desire for for truth and for goodness, Israel is not going to respond this way. Um, Ham- Hamas was was clear about its demands, and there could be some kind of process of negotiations and, and and discussion about how to work this out. I think there should be some process of of justice. I don't know how that justice works in this reality. I think it is expected for Israel to attack Hamas. Israel killed killed all of the militia members who entered into Israel, so I guess there was some kind of retribution there. Um, Israel is not in a good place where Hamas is embedded in the in the population, and Hamas functions uh, and like uses guerrilla tactics. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't know. I think yeah. it needs some kind of statementship. It can in, um, does, it requires some kind of wisdom and 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 care and like the U.S. actually playing a significant and important role here. Um, the Israeli attack is expected. Uh, I don't think we expected this this much, like loss of human life. Um, it's expected. I mean, they always have been doing this, and that's the the this is the world order. This is the order of the U.S. and and Israel. This is how it functions. You you act out of vengeance and violence, without trying to recognize your own culpability, your own responsibility, and without trying to to address the core issue. Um, but like, aside from this current Israeli campaign, the solution is justice. Is establishing, creating the conditions where the conditions of justice are met, and then Palestinians can live in dignity. But as long as you continue blockade, as long as they continue to kill people and and and, 
and humiliate them and so on and oppress them, of course, this is going to continue. And and the this cycle of violence is going to continue. Like, even yeah. if this is over, even if Hamas is over, like, don't be shocked if something else happens in two years because we're not really pursuing justice. We're just pursuing vengeance. Yeah. And as long as the same system of supremacy and, and oppression and violence continues in Palestine, it, this is always going to escalate. The solution is for the U.S. to become a fair and balanced arbiter of peace and actually pursue justice and put pressure on Israel to um, to submit to the UN resolutions and international law and to find an, an, an end, a quick end to this, to have a ceasefire and to look for like good like solutions to the conflict rather than continuing the circle of violence. I don't know. I'm not a politician. I'm not yeah. a policymaker. I'm not a minister of defense. I understand how nations think. I just think that there's a creative role of Christians and how we think about the world and how we think about humanity and the image of God and, and likeness in, in God's mm. people. And that should be create for us the, the infrastructure and the way we process the world. Like what Russell Moore says is not different from what Netanyahu says, but both of them are wrong in they both of them are opposing the gospel of Christ. <laughs> like that is clear to me. <laughs> the gospel of truth and justice and mercy is not the gospel of Russell Moore and not the gospel of Netanyahu. Like, I'm sorry. Um, so if, but if we start with the gospel of truth and goodness and love to the world, including the sinners, including Hamas, maybe we can have a better way to think about the world. And maybe we can have a, thing, a better way to, to react and not just wait for the repressed to fight back, maybe you should address what's been happening for 75 years. And maybe you can address this when this whole um, uh, cycle of violence is over. I don't know. You hope so and you pray so that yeah. God's wisdom and truth and love would prevail at the end and the kingdom of God would be known. Um, but I'm not holding my breath, sadly, right now. It, it, I, I'm, I'm going to let you go, man. I, I, every, <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. I... I yeah. um, both my mind and especially my heart is filled. And, um, mm. I, 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 I don't know what this say. And Reese almost said like, I'm sorry for what's happened, but that's almost belittling just to say, I'm sorry. Mm. You know, I, I, I just want, I thank you for giving us, um, context. And I know some people, there is no context, whatever. And I, I just fundamentally disagree with that. If, if we want to prevent future things like this from happening, it's necessary to go back and understand the context. If hurt people hurt people, we need to understand how that first person was hurt so that we don't repeat the cycle of violence all over again by hurting people mm -hmm. in the future. So, mm -hmm. so I think understanding context is a way to um, lessen violence and establish a kind of justice, you know, um, that will all, all, there will always be an already not yet, you know, but that should reflect uh, some semblance of the gospel of Christ. Daniel, thank you for your, um, yeah. Thank you for coming on Theology Now. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, your podcast. Your podcast. Yeah. You have a podcast coming out, Across the Divide. Can you just give us a little commercial? Yeah, so this is um, this is a podcast that I'm launching with another with some friends of mine from the U.S. and from Palestine, uh, led by Christians. Uh, all of us are evangelicals. I think we still call ourselves evangelicals. <laughs> and we are we are basically trying to unpack a lot of these issues that I talked about Mm -hmm. especially through the lens of Christ, especially through a Palestinian Christian uh, reflection. Uh, Palestinian theology has been going on for a number of years, for tens of years, for decades now, and we've been dealing and thinking about our lived reality for a long time. Uh, I think uh, a lot in the West tend to pontificate and just talk about us and while silencing and ignoring us. And I think, uh, I think this is kind of our attempt to have these conversations about faith and politics, about our our lived, lived reality and, and try to see what the Bible and what our faith can tell us um, mm -hmm. in response to what we're experiencing. So it's a conversation between friends and we're having interviews with people. We have some like really cool uh, interviews lined up right now mm -hmm. by American, American pastors, Christian uh, Palestinian pastors and mm -hmm. theologians and so on, discussions, discussing issues like why Palestine matters, discussing uh, justice and, and spirituality. And mm. we're going to be talking about Gaza next as well. So yeah, hopefully a good conversation at the intersection of Palestine, at the inter intersection of faith and politics in the context of Palestine as well. So yeah, check it out, you guys, Across the Divide. By the time this releases, it's, it may be out or about hopefully. to be yeah. released. So yeah. uh, again, Daniel, thank you so much for uh, your heart and for coming on uh, Theology in Iraq. Thanks, man. Thank you.
This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.